Metallica, here they come, the kings of metal. Hi, it's me, David Mustaine, and you're listening to Metal Up Your Podcast. Nice story. Welcome to Metal Up Your Podcast. I'm Ethan Luck. And I'm Clint Wells. This is episode 184, and we are having a great conversation with our friend Brandon over at Metallicast this week. Yeah, for those of you who are sort of part of this whole podcasting universe centered around Metallica, there are a lot of us out there. We all know Tom Quee at Alpha Metallica. We've got Ryan Downey at Speak and Destroy. We've got the the, the hilarious dudes over at Metallichat. Some of the newer ones, uh, I think there's one called No Life Till Metallica. There's uh, in Podcast for All. But then, of course, part of the original big four or five of non-Bay Area podcasting is Brandon <laughs> at Metallicast. And uh, he's based out of Connecticut. He's a cool dude. He's a music teacher and a father. He loves the band. And we've been friends ever since he came on the scene. A couple of summers ago, I was a guest on his show talking about To Live Is To Die from Justice. And uh, we've been talking about doing a crossover jam for a while. I want to do a crossover sitch with all the other Metallica podcast out there, and uh, we we see all of these people as friends and allies, and uh, it's such a treat to be able to talk to them and 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 share some of our fans and some of our stories and all that stuff. So that's what this episode is. We are going to hear a little bit from him about his uh, album rankings and his top ten Metallica songs currently, which there were some pretty interesting surprises on his there list. Was some cur- yeah, curveballs for sure. Some stuff that I I really didn't even consider. Uh, in in the Metallica world of all their songs. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, took me by surprise. On it was few. basically the mechanics, the mechanics, the mechanics, the mechanics, the mechanics. I think it's top five of yeah. the mechanics. Exactly. Which I hadn't which counted is, on. Uh, yeah, so. I, that, that was the biggest, that was like a knuckleball. Well, um, it is good to see you. This is, good we're sort of too. catching up here after the interview. We're doing this remotely. We're being safe. Yeah. And uh, I'm wearing a Michael Jordan Birmingham Barons number 45 baseball jersey. You are so, with, with with your Jordan hat too. So that's just basically a place, you know, if someone was asking me how I was doing mentally, that's how I would answer them. And I think it says a lot. Just, yeah, you just send them a picture of your outfit. Like, how you doing? Like, really? How you really doing? I'm like, well, I'm wearing a Michael Jordan 1994 Birmingham Barons number 45 baseball <laughs> jersey. <laughs> Love it. So anyway, we are an All Metallica podcast. If you uh, if you don't know that by now, I don't know how you got here or what you're doing here, but you're going to enjoy it if you stick around, I think, maybe. I think we hope. Uh, we're going to hit some news here. So interesting. We've had an interesting week, right? Probably the most uh, fascinating and titillating news since lockdown, yeah. maybe since Blackened 2020, which was a pretty exciting week. But the boys posted some videos. They are all together at HQ rehearsing. Super exciting. So, obviously, Metallica nerds the world over, including us, were speculating, wanting to know what's going on. They're together. They were rehearsing Creeping Death. And then they put out another video of them playing Blackened. They're wearing masks, except for James. Uh, this happened all on the socials, right? We, we sort of honed in on the fact that Rob has a music stand that seems to have a set list. Mm-hmm. I'm told that over on the... Uh, forums which i haven't really visited the forums in a while but i'm told that over there someone enhanced that photo and was able to see the set list yeah and it's mostly like greatest hits creeping death fade to black inner sandman nothing else matters sure then the boys wrote something else about howard stern and Sirius radio um so and then right before we recorded this episode someone sent us a thing saying that their metallica is going to be doing a live stream for drive-in movie theater so help me put all this together let me put all these pieces together, bro. What's going <laughs> on a, over there at HQ? There's a lot happening. It sounds like they, they, they've had a, a few things planned. 
And now they've all descended upon the Bay Area at HQ1 with a limited crew, it looks like, according to the videos a little bit. Um, and they're just about to, you know, they're rehearsing and about to roll out all these ideas, you know, and everything from doing an appear- a stream appearance on Howard Stern uh, to this drive-in movie theater thing, which, depending on when that is, that could be kind of fun to do. The only downside is the closest drive-in theater to either of us is out in Watertown, Tennessee, which is about 45, 50 minutes away. Dude, we should still go. We should totally, I didn't even think about that. We should go. It'd be fun if if they're doing if they're doing it there, right? I'm not sure yet. I don't, I don't think it's gonna be every drive-in theater in the country, but uh, probably select ones in different in areas. They may be doing a big announcement tomorrow. As of this recording, it's Sunday evening on the ninth, and they may announce it tomorrow. But the only thing we know is someone sort of did a you know some mild Sherlock Holmes shit where there was like a preview page on YouTube that that sort of advertised Metallica's doing these drive-in shows. So. I you think know, Live Nation put out an email about oh, did about they? It or something. Okay. I think yeah, because the same person that sent us that info sent it to me uh, uh, separately as well. Okay, and I was like, "What on earth is this?" I was just so confused at first. <laughs> what on earth is this? And uh, he said that they found out mainly through Live Nation. So. Okay, cool. Well, you know, as usual, we're sort of the one stop shop for Metallica news and information. So if you want to follow us on the socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, we are sort of riffing all week on what's going on with the boys our opinions. We're retweeting the Metal Up Your Podcast community, etc. If you like the show, you can leave a positive review on iTunes. Really can't stress how simple that is for you to do and how important it is for us as a podcast. Uh, mm-hmm. You can even just leave five stars and not even write anything, but it only takes a second. You can find all the links for that in the description of however you receive this podcast. And we also have a Patreon, which of course everyone does, um, yep. but it's important, especially for people like Ethan and I who rely on this kind of support now in such a strange time, it's basically our only income. Right. Um, we never we never started this podcast for it to be our job ever. And it was always just a way to put more money into the show. But now it really has become, you know, a part of our lives that we depend on. So yeah. if you are willing and able and you've and if and really only if I you know, if you think the show has value. If you're if you're listening to this podcast every week and it's your favorite podcast and it brightens up your Monday and all that fun stuff. And if you're willing and able, you know, supporting us on Patreon is is the right thing to do, I think. If you can, mm-hmm, yeah. if you can swing it. So it's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Metal Up Your Podcast. We do have a commercial for it. And not only that, but you get a whole bunch of shit over there. A ton of stuff. You get a whole bunch of albums and cover EPs of Metallica and bonus content. So if you can do it, awesome. If not, no big deal. We did get three new patrons. I want to say hello to them and thank you. Anthony Broom, Body Rot, and Donnie Minshall. Yeah. What the Thank world you all. That is needs awesome. now is patrons, sweet patrons. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, we have not done this in a while, but we've been getting a lot of requests for merch. So we started a new EverPress campaign. What's an EverPress mm-hmm. campaign? It's the way that we do our t-shirts. It's really good for this time because EverPress, basically, they make the shirts, they ship the shirts, they deal with everything with the shirts. They ship internationally. So we don't have to make a $600 order of shirts, have them all sit in my garage until we sell off 50 of them. Mm-hmm. They're made to order. Uh, the link for it is in our socials, and it's only a limited time. As of you guys hearing this episode, there are only 11 more days for you to order your Dagger logo Metal Up Your Podcast t-shirt. That's right. So go get on that. Ethan has another uh, podcast called The Pirate Satellite that you just restarted. Kind of re- just revamped it. My first episode will come out... Uh... As of today, uh, in two days, on Wednesday, and it's uh, my buddy named Nate Bergman, who is an awesome musician, great solo artist, and from a band called Lion Eyes. And you can and you can get that anywhere you get podcasts, right? So correct. Yeah. Go check out the Pirate Satellite. My other podcast is called I'm Okay. You're okay. oh god, I'm okay. You're okay. I'm not okay. You're not okay. We obviously Yay. crushed it titling that. <laughs> now that's with me and my friend Bob Schneider, a musician based out of Austin, Texas, who I toured with for like seven or eight years. And there are new episodes every Monday and Thursday morning. I want to say thanks to patron By- uh, Brian, who we dubbed Lord Byron. Lord Byron. He sent us a blackened whiskey bottle, Batch 99, signed by Lars Ulrich. I've heard of him. Drummer for Megadeth. That is honestly, it, yeah, the f- seventh drummer of Megadeth. Uh, that's honestly one of the most generous things that a uh, listener has sent us. It's it really, really uh, touching gift. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's super cool, Brian. Thank you so much. Now, we're going to knock out a few emails here before we talk to our friend Brandon at Metallicast. You can email us, metal up your podcast show at gmail.com. We read all of them personally. We respond to as many as we can. Although 
honestly, that is getting a little harder to do to actually respond to a lot of these. But then we read five or six uh, on every episode. So will yours be read on the show? Who knows? Send us the email and uh, get in our ears. Go follow us on the socials. Come be a part of what's so cool about the Metal Up Your Podcast family. And we'll dip in now to what we lovingly refer to as the email portal All right, our first email is from Graham Smith. He says, what's up, brothers? Uh, Clint, I really enjoyed your radio episode. I listened to it while uh, sitting in my garden with a few beers on a sunny evening in Coventry, England, New Jersey. Uh, your new songs are uh, uh, your, sorry. Your new songs are beautiful, not depressing at all. The Lunar Satan Jam rocks, of course, honey. Please, that's all. Peace and love from Graham. Cool. Yeah, I did a, the first Metal Up Your Podcast radio episode in five months. Dang, man, I got to bust one of those out this week. You absolutely do. And uh, I played all the songs I've been writing during lockdown. And it was a fun thing. It was an Ask Me Anything. So I got about 30 questions from listeners of Metal Up Your Podcast all about all sorts of shit. Michael Jordan and Metallica and music and the music industry and COVID and politics and religion. If you like that sort of thing, it's our last episode. Go check it out. Thanks, Graham. I'm glad you dug it, dude. Thank you for the compliment about the songs. And by the way, speaking of Lunar Satan. Yeah. The debut Lunar Satan song, the first song I ever wrote for the Lunar Satan project called We Ride the Skies is being mixed this week by one Mr. Paul Moak, Esquire. Paul. Paul? That's amazing. I can't wait to hear uh, Paul's touch on that thing. Dude, not only that, but Chris Cockamese, the guy who played bass on it, who he works for the bass channel, this like bass channel. He totally surprised me with this. We're going to link this in our socials, but he sent me a video it's an hour long, and it's five different bass players playing different bass lines to We Ride the Skies. Whoa. And it's because the premise of the video is like how different bass players approach writing a bass line. Or, so he just, he had the, um, he had the bounce of the song with no bass, which I sent him so he could play bass to it. Right. But he had this idea of what if I sent this bassless version of We Ride the Skies to five different bitch and bass players? That's and awesome. they recorded it. They re- they recorded the tone. They talked about how they approach each section of the song. They're all completely different and Whoa. all completely badass. Dude, I can't wait to hear it. It's you know, really, it. really cool. So it really gave me a lot of encouragement to get this Lunar Satan shit just tight and right and done. Heck yeah, man. That's great. All right. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate that. Heath Teddy writes in, hey, guys, just want to let you know, uh, I listened to both parts of your Some Kind of Commentary episodes. I really enjoyed them. It was like Mystery Science Theater 3000 does Metallica, which we've heard that before, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Uh, he says, some kind of monster, in my opinion, it's the greatest rock doc ever made. I always take something new away from it. Listening to you guys, I came to the realization that the reason things were so strained between James and Jason is that Jason was a constant reminder to James that Cliff was gone. That's not Jason's fault, nor James's for that matter, but the guys had to audition bass players the day after they buried Cliff. I just don't think they gave themselves time for those wounds to heal. and not doing so, they inadvertently put Jason in a box he could never get out of as long as he was in the band. You add in touring the world, making records, blowing up into the biggest band in the world, money, booze, drugs, women, egos, etc. That's a recipe for disaster. He says, Jason had to quit the fucking band, period, exclamation point. (laughs) I mean, it's fucking so pathetic. This this, this is like sandbox shit. This is like when I see my fucking... My kid argue with his friend over who gets to fucking play with a lightsaber. Seriously. This is the fucking sandbox. Well, he's wounded. Huh? He's wounded. Yeah, but, you know, it's up to him to mend himself, and we're giving him every opportunity. He fucking left the band! He fucking left the band! Which part of that is... Hello? (laughs) You know what I mean? He fucking left the band. I mean, period. Exclamation point. Which part of that is forgotten? I I just... Which part of that got left out of the equation? The fuck did we turn into the bad guys? I don't understand that part. He fucking left the fucking band. Jesus Christ. To make James respect him, and I think James does respect him now that he's sober and wiser with age... With all that said, with respect to Jason's numerous contributions to the band, I'm under the firm belief that Rob Trujillo helped save Metallica. Case in point, the two albums he's played on have been the band's best in decades. 
I don't think that's a coincidence. Keep up the good work and zone it, Heath. Zoning it hard over here, Heath. Well, I will say it's their only two records in decades. <laughs> I mean, yeah. They take a long time to make albums. I mean, I agree with that. Rob is the guy for the job now. Yeah. James or uh, Jason, so many things swirled together for that to be this weird, perfect storm. He was this crazy scapegoat. And of course, he could never really fill Cliff's shoes and he was never really forgiven for that. Right. I, I actually recently re rewatched the. Um, did you ever see this even? When they were doing the puppets box set, they did this big interview with with um, uh, uh, David Frick, the Rolling Stone guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's really cool. Like I think they had Michael Wagner kind of bounce in there, and maybe yeah. Fleming bounced in there. Fle Fleming did too. Yeah, they did it in Europe. It's in Europe, and it's at it's in a tuning room. Yeah, they sort of reconfigured a tuning room, and it's sort of a deep dive into into puppets. Maybe an hour long combo. And I listened to it when it came out, but I recently revisited it, revisited it while I was cooking or something. And James says some pretty interesting stuff about that. He's like, he basically says like, we, oh no, sorry. This was them talking about justice, the justice box. Set. Oh, that was justice. Yeah. Um, James is saying, you know, we never really forgave him for being a fan. I thought that was a really fascinating. He was like, yeah, he's like, we, we just always didn't like that. He was such a big fan. And it really bothered me. Cause I'm like, well, you hired him. You knew what the yeah. deal. And you're mad at him because he loved you so much. It's just weird. Yeah. But I get his point too, where he's like, Cliff kind of couldn't be bothered. And that was what was so cool about him. Cliff wouldn't even show up to the airport to fly out <laughs> to make the fucking album. Totally. Because they're like, Hey, are you going to come to LAX or wherever they were? And he's like, no, you guys just, you guys just argue about drum sounds for the first week. Anyway, I'm going to stay here and eat Mexican food with my girlfriend. They're like, okay, yeah. well that's Cliff. <laughs> and he said, and another thing that had less to do with personality and more to do with playing is he was like, you know, Jason was always like a huge student of like wanting to mimic the rhythm. They were like, we want we what we loved about Cliff was he always did something weird. Yeah, for so sure. So he talks about how they would get frustrated with Jason in a recording sitch, talking about justice, right? And what might have been a little weird about the lack of bass on justice, where he's like, Jason just always stuck to the riff, and we were always trying to get him to he basically was like, We just wanted him to be Cliff and he wasn't Cliff. Right, right. Which exactly. wasn't his fault, but at the time that they were twenty three yeah, year old dummies. Just all that, all that sort of negative shit energy got did get pushed onto Jason for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for absolutely for sure. Anyway, all right. Our end. next email is from James. <laughs> There's no last name, so we can only assume it's it's Headfield. He said, uh, "Guys, really enjoy the Rain and Blood episode. Like you, I much prefer when they go halftime. For that reason, you must do their South of Heaven album. It's similar, similar to Seasons in the Abyss in terms of tempo and groove riffs, and just as good." Enjoy James Potter. Oh, Potter, there he is. It's not Hatfield. Confirmed, not Hatfield. That's actually Harry Potter's dad, James Potter. It's, yeah, James Potter. Um, what do you think about South of Heaven? Is that our next to Slayer album uh, to investigate? It, 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 sure. Uh, that, that, that's something I can't really uh, speak on. I, I don't think. I can't tell you when I listened to South of Heaven last, but... Um, but if it's more in that in that groovy territory, then I'd be probably more apt to listen to it than Rain and Blood. But again. since but since Rain and the Blood was our last uh, explore the big four, we have to cycle through Megadeth and Anthrax. Yes, for sure. Which we do later in a later email. Um, we do have someone mentions another Anthrax album. So yeah. All right, cool. Thanks, James Potter. Thank you. Tell Harry I said hello and cheerio, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Andy Salter writes in, Hey lads, just finished the Clint Ask Me Anything episode. I sometimes disagree with Clint on things, and as a listener of both Metal Up Your Podcast and the Not Okay Podcast, I notice Clint finds something he loves and throws himself into it, like Bob Dylan, Michael Jordan, etc. I watched The Last Dance and thought, yeah, that was good, and moved on with my day. But the way he explained how these things were something to grab onto when he was feeling depressed or hopeless really struck a nerve with me, as I know that feeling very well. When you feel lost and find yourself not feeling joy and constantly feel like you have a black cloud following you around and asking yourself, why can't I just feel happiness anymore? Finding something that will give you a sense of hope and enjoyment that you can throw yourself into and be passionate about is super important. At the moment, I'm going through the very same sense of hopelessness and hearing the episode really helped me to not feel so alone and that someone you're a fan of is going through those very same emotions. So thanks, Mr. Wells. I'm now looking for my Michael Jordan and something to grab onto in these dark days. I just found my old drawings and art I did in high school and remembered how much joy they gave me uh, that I might throw myself back into that. Thank you to Ethan for, well, just being Ethan. <laughs> You're welcome. 
Anyway, stay safe and take care of each other. Andy Salter, Gold Coast, New Jersey. That's cool, Andy. Well, Andy, hang in there, of course, and definitely find your Michael Jordan, man. If, if that means it, it is getting back into painting, then by all means, do it. You know, this is this is a weird world we, that literally everybody is living in this crazy, messed up time, and it's it's not helping mental health at all. So if you're uh, if you find something, you're Michael Jordan, as you said, and uh, man, hang on to it and run with it because it'll it'll definitely help. And it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's sports, if you're not a sports person, or if it's art, if you're not an art person. If it's if it's some pop artist or pop record, if it's a fucking Madonna song that you like, yeah. it just doesn't matter anymore. Whatever it is, find it and hold on to it for yeah. sure. Clint's Michael Jordan just happens to be Michael Jordan. So. I got lucky in that regard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and not Michael B. Jordan, the actor, the, right. the athlete. Your you're Michael Jordan might, might be Michael B. Jordan, the actor from Black Panther. And and Creed. And Creed 2. He was also in Creed and Creed 2, and he was in the band Creed. That's right. He co-wrote with Arms Wide Open. <laughs> he did. Him and Mark Tremonti co-wrote that one. Uh, <laughs> anyways, well, Andy, hang in there, buddy, and thanks for the email. Uh, next email is from Joe. He says, hey, guys, I just listened to your, uh, your episode of Top 10 Metallica albums. Here are mine. Number 10, Kill em All. Kill, kill, wow. Kill em All? Kill em All. Sorry, I'm not much of a fan of it. Okay, that's interesting. Um, number 9, Load. Number 8, Reload. Oh, sorry, Clint. Number seven, Death Magnetic. Number six, St. Anger. There it is. Boom. Number five, Hardwired. Number four, Ride the Lightning. Number three, Justice. Number two, Master. And number one, The Black Album. He says, thanks, guys. Hope you're staying safe during these times. Take care. Joe from New Jer- Florida, New Jersey. Not New wow. Jersey, dude. Dude, you know what? People from New Jersey like St. Anger. <laughs> they do. Even though, you know, Brandon will get into where his is, but uh, he, he, he showed some love for it. Right. All right. Next email from Peter Lynch. Hi, Clinton, Ethan. Hope you and your families are well. I've been fiddling with my jukebox, and that was just your life came on. Had a very nice guitar solo in it from old Kirky Kirk. I only just finished listening to the second part of the Some Kind of Monster commentary episode, and it reminded me of the solos are outdated, and Kirk said, well, no, it will date the album, which well apart from Lars's kettle drums, it did date the album. I agree. Yeah. I got really excited and thought a Metallica song without a solo is not a Metallica song. Hope the world gets back to normal. Hopefully the blessing in disguise is maybe the guys can produce an album in isolation, which, by the way, our new metal band called Album in Isolation. Good night, Dark Continent. We are Album in Isolation. <laughs> I think you guys should do a commentary on Anthrax's Stomp 44-2. 442? Oh, yeah, Stomp 442, yeah. I think it would have to be the heaviest, their heaviest album. He says Dimebag R.I.P. heavily influenced the album, and it features John Bush. Also, they produced a double version, which had John Bush singing Joey Belladonna songs. Love you guys. Peace and adios. Peter from Caboolture, New Jersey. I, I haven't listened to that Anthrax record in a while, but uh, it, it, it Why is... Why is it called it is Stomp cool 442? What a title. I, I, I don't remember why it was called Stomp 442, but uh, um, yeah, and you know, John Bush, great singer. Uh, that's a really cool era of Anthrax, but uh, yeah, that'd be, I would love to run through that record. Okay. Well, maybe that might be the next one, because we, we've... Oh, did we decide, are we doing Risk or Cryptic Writings for Megadeth next? I, we might have to... It might be a coin toss. Risk is going to be... I think there's going to be some fatigue involved in that for sure. Uh, <laughs> cryptic Writings might be the smarter choice. Okay. I think Risk might be good for humor's sake, because it's not a great record, but I don't know. It, we'll is see. Cryptic Writings before or after Risk? Before. It's before Risk. So yeah, that's yeah. right. So people were saying Cryptic Writings is like the load reload. And risk is like St. Anger. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that sort of the analogy yeah, th- people were doing? I think so, yeah. I think so. All right, we have one more email, and I save this for last because it is a beautiful email from our friend Namarda, and we wanted to just take a moment, carve this time out. And uh, so, Ethan, if you'll do the Anna's. I shall. Namarda says, hey, guys, great news to share with my Metal Pure Podcast family. I found out today that I don't, I don't have cancer. Uh, I had a mole that was suspicious for uh, melanoma, and it's all clear. While waiting for my results, I spent a lot of time binging on Metal Pit Podcast episodes. So I just want to say thank, thank you guys for all the content and giving me so- something to look forward to. Much love, Namarto. Well, that's great news. I'm going to clap for that. Fan- I'm clapping for that. <laughs> Absolutely. That is amazing. Congratulations, Namarta. That's a super scary thing to be worried about. I'm glad that the results came in negative and that you're healthy and... Uh, and I'm glad Great. that you thought to share it with us and that maybe us two knuckleheads talking about Metallica helped you get through some of that crazy in-between time. Hey, it's A, it's our pleasure. And B, we're just we're just thankful that someone that puts so much time and and, uh, and thought just even into listening to our show uh, be willing to share something like that with us. And we're so happy for you that you're in the clear. Cool. You can write in Metal Up Your Podcast Show at gmail.com. We will read it on the show. 
We will read it in person privately, and we will respond to it if we have time. Of course. Of course we will. Well, what do you say we go uh, talk to Brandon over at Metallicast? Down. Let's do it. You're really good at that. Hey everyone, this is Ethan and Clint. We're here to tell you about supporting the show via Patreon. That's right. Every week, Ethan and I work hard to bring you the best Metallica content possible. If you think the show has value, consider supporting us on a financial level at Patreon. For $5 a month, or the price of two cups of coffee, you can ensure that Metal Up Your Podcast continues to grow in quality and content. But that's not all. In addition to being able to help sleep at night for supporting your favorite podcast, we've also come up with incentives to say thank you that are exclusively available to patrons. For example, for a pledge of $5 or more, you immediately get free downloads of every cover our world black and ep ticket giveaways for shows like snm2 and slain castle box sets rare vinyl metallica memorabilia like snm2 guitar picks email priority meaning we'll read your email first on the show the chance to ask guests like hailstorm jay weinberg of slipknot and metallica row crew your very own questions and the opportunity to come on the show as a guest for our metal tales bonus episodes in which you can tell us all about any Metallica show you've been to in the past. All this and more for becoming a patron and supporting Metal Up Your Podcast. We couldn't do this show without you, and to everyone on the ride with us, we sincerely thank you. Peace. Adios. All right, well, here we are with Brandon of Metallicast, one of the other... Several now, the playing field's gotten quite large here of other Metallica podcasts based out of Connecticut. And I've been on Brandon's show before. I would I would say that out of all the ones that we have now, Brandon is part of the OG, like is it with the big four of Metallica podcasts, right? Because <laughs> I think there are like seven or eight now. That we I get I guess we get referred to as the big four a lot. Yeah. Kind of a, the the initial wave, I guess. I was on the tail end of the wave. Okay, because I know Tom, it was Tom, Metallichat, us, and then you were the were you the next one on the scene? I was the next one, I believe. Yeah, right. That or, or maybe speaking to destroy as well. Ryan. Oh yeah, started, shit. Forgot about that too. Yeah. Ryan started a yeah. few months a few months after us. We should. I mean, we have enough people now to populate a small island. Like <laughs> during apocalyptic times, which we may or may not be living in, we might want to consider all taking our families and relocating to some sort of island and starting over there. And then I mean, we could, down. yeah. I mean, talk about having a podcast with a lot of co-hosts. We could all just join forces, <laughs> and there'd be like t- twenty people t- discussing Master of Puppets. I mean, in fairness, it would really narrow down the amount of podcasts in the world if everybody did that. You know, everybody and their dog has one now, so we might as well yeah. just consolidate the efforts, dude. I we went can... on, yeah, totally. I went on a riff last week on our on one of our episodes about how everyone has a Patreon now, including Michael Jordan. <laughs> to help offset some of the uh, mortgage payments on his 15 mansions across the world. Uh, hey, man, you got to get the money from somewhere, right? But but it's true. Like, And it does seem like, I mean, maybe it was Hardwired was coming out. Maybe it was we all sort of co- in the collective unconscious noticed that there wasn't this conversation happening in podcast land. But we all did sort of seem to have the idea around within a year. So yeah. what was it for you? I mean, what give us a little bit of, I mean, I'm sure a lot of our listeners listen to your show, so we don't want to bore anyone too much with backstory, but like what, what about, what about your fandom brought you to, to the podcast intersection a couple of years ago? You know, I was just looking, I, I've, besides being a big fan of Metallica, obviously I really got into just podcasts in general. Um, it's fun. I just did, um, I just recorded an episode last week. They'll be out in a couple of weeks. I'm, my guest and I were talking because he's also a podcaster and we were talking about what the first time we heard about podcasts was like this mythical thing. I was like, I didn't really quite understand what it was. All I know is that eventually I got an iPhone. And I was like, there's a podcast app. Let me go to this and see what everybody's talking about. And I was like, wait a minute. All this stuff is free. And then I just started checking out a few shows that people had recommended to me and discovering things on my own. And I just sort of fell through, like fell through the rabbit hole um, and checked out a bunch of really cool shows. And uh, I, my cousin, he runs a, a site called fans, not experts dot com. Um, and he 
pumps out a bunch of podcasts. Of they do own. they do an Iron Maiden Iron Maiden podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. He awesome. he's also the host of that one called Made in Order. I'll give them a shout out on here. And uh um, for a small fee, of course. For the yeah, of course. Course. For, it's, Bill a me later. Of Hulk, it's a fraction of Hulk Bill Hogan's me later. fee. But it is a small <laughs> fee. <laughs> so we, you know, he get, He's always in my ear to kind of get me on to do something on my own or with him. And we had done a couple things. And the the problem was always um, either I lost interest in it or, well, actually, that was usually the problem. I just lost interest in whatever we were doing. Um, but Metallica is the one thing that I felt like I was truly had this passion for and this knowledge for. And my wife was tired of me turning every conversation into and about Metallica. So <laughs> I decided, you know what, let me try to do a Metallica podcast. And truth be told at that time, I didn't know of you guys. I didn't know of you or uh, Tom or any of the shows. Um, I assumed at that point, this was like a few years ago now. So I assumed at that point there was shows out there, um, but it wasn't really until I start. I joined Twitter because I, I, jo- I started my Twitter account at Metallica spot before I even recorded an episode just to kind of, you know, for promotion and whatnot and to see what was out there. And that's when I kind of stumbled upon you guys and the other shows and the whole community. And I was like, well, I, did, I had no clue the future was out there. Let me check them out. And I was like, how can I kind of put my own spin on this? So I think, you know, as a, I'm a music teacher, that's my day job. Awesome. Um, so I think being having the education background being a fan, it just sort of my willingness to t- talk to people and want to hear cool stories and interact with the community and interact with the fans and combine all those things. I feel like I could kind of have my own little thing, different point of view or what have you. Um, so I did an episode, figured if five people listen to this, I'll do a second one and then just kind of kept on going and going. And here I am in year three. And uh, it still surprised me that people listen and give a shit, but fortunately they do. So it's it's been a really cool journey. And I, you know, just hope that the show can continue to grow. But that's really, you know, what brought me to is just an interest in Metallica, an interest in podcasts and wanting to have a, a creative outlet in that way. If five people can listen and three out of those five people are members of Metallica, then I'll be fine. Then I'll be happy with it. <laughs> then I'll be happy. It's just, that's my only goal for myself. The only that's five, it. but three of the five do need to be uh, current members of the band Metallica. Now, if, <laughs> now, if it, now, if one person listens, but it's Michael Jordan and he's, and he's into it, then I have not achieved my goals. <laughs> right. I still need three of the four members of Metallica. So I want, I was actually curious when you were talking about kind of, uh, digging into podcasts for the first time, getting the iPhone and that, that sort of elusive world. What I'm curious if there are any podcasts you discovered then that you still listen to. It's funny. Um, not really. Like I, I, I think initially I checked out a lot of the big ones, you know, like uh, I think even, you know, three years ago, Joe Rogan was still big. I'm not a big Joe Rogan fan, but, you know, I checked out his show, checked out Mark Marin and kind of all the big right. ones that are kind of go tos. And then it was kind of the um, was it I'm not. Was Serial, how long ago was Serial? Does anybody know? That was I never like did. I never dug into that. Season. I, think, I think that last one was probably two to three years ago, maybe. Maybe a little longer. I don't know. So whenever that, that first season was, that was one that really like pulled me in. Um, and I kind of got into different true crime podcasts. Like uh, I really like last podcast on the left. If, uh, if anybody has an interest about true crime, serial killers, supernatural, yeah. paranormal type stuff. Um, and they do it all with like a really fun sense of humor. Um, but yet yeah, not a lot of the shows I initially checked out really stayed with me. Um, I kind of went big into comedy podcasts when I think first started and like interviews. And now I'm more into the music podcast and seeing what other people are doing that are uh, whether it's you guys or Sabbath Blade podcast or um, shows like that that kind of do more deep dives into a band's catalog or do interviews with artists. Um, so I've definitely gravitated more towards that in recent I absolutely times. love yeah, man. Rye over at Sabbath Bloody Podcast. I love oh, yeah. his spirit and his vibe. And he, like you, is mainly kind of rocking it solo. So, but yeah. you also have guests. You either have like, you know, you've had Alago on yourself. You've had Johnny Z on. 
you've had some yeah. really cool people, but you also have like other fan type stuff, which we do that occasionally with our Metal Tales stuff. Yeah. But you mostly kind of go it alone, right? So what's that been like? Is it, do you wish you maybe started up with a with a partner? Do you sometimes like Anthony Kiedis crooning in Under the Bridge <laughs> think sometimes you wish you had a partner? Or you feel like you don't have totally. a partner rather? Or, or, yeah, I, or are you still looking for your <laughs> for your flea? <laughs> well, it's funny. I was actually thinking about that recently because I was trying to think of the last episode I did by myself because initially all my episodes were solo. And the benefit of doing that is you can get more into the editing part of it, I think, and the production part of it. and But it just was not as much fun, I found, once I started having guests on. Um, and, you know, like you said, I started having listeners and other fans on. Um, and then it, in re, like we're, over the last year sort of evolved into having uh, Alago and Johnny Z and um, this band Crypt Sermon that I'm really into. They're like a doomy Sabbathy style band, but influenced by Metallica. I had a couple of their members on. So just now it's I, now I prefer to record with um, with somebody else. And pretty much every episode now has somebody. But I like having a revolving cast of characters, so to speak, and. Cause I, I just like talking to people. I realized and hearing how they became fans and um, how they got into the band and their takes about Saint Anger and this album, this album, you know, and it, I think it gets, it just mixes it up. It allows different point of views. And for me, I, one of the big reasons why I started the podcast besides my interest in podcasts and Metallica and it being a creative outlet for me was just it, it's an excuse to talk to people and meet people yeah. in the community. And I mean, there are people that have been on the show, not been on the show that I would have never, ever met if not for doing Metallic ass. Um, and, and there are people that I would, that start off as like a guest that I would now consider a friend, even if I've not met them in person, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. crazy, but yeah, I mean that uh, we've noticed that. I mean, really in the first couple months, uh, the second we started doing this and putting the word out there and, uh, whether it's through social media <clears throat> or the Metallica forums, it was like opening Pandora's box of Metallica fans. It was like the floodgates opened, and not only did we meet a bunch of cool people, have guests with Metal Tales, stuff like that, but became really good friends with a lot of these people. And and it wasn't just this weird fan thing, like oh, these you know a lot of these fans are kind of weird to us. You know, it's like we really true you know <laughs> yeah. tr tr true good friends now. You know, it's the Sar yeah. Sarah Sobek people like that. Um, and it's it, it's still a constantly constantly blows my mind. Like if I just get a random text from somebody just checking in or whatever, or a message on Instagram or something, and I'm like, I met that person because me and my friend are in front of a microphones talking about Metallica. It's just yeah, it still seems very surreal to me. I know. Like uh, uh, for example, Richard S. He, he's been a frequent guest of mine. He's a music journalist. He's done like freelance work for Billboard and Noisy and a bunch of publications. Um, but I initially, he wrote a article in defense of St. Anger that I just randomly stumbled upon and I like tracked him down on Twitter and sent him a message. I was like, Hey, I do this metallic podcast. Do you have any interest? So he came on the show initially as, you know, this journalist talking about this article and now he's been on the show, I think perhaps more than anybody else. And we're just good friends now. I would, it, but we've never met in person. He's in Australia. I'm in Connecticut. It's just sort of crazy how it all happened. But, um, you know, I've done a couple of live streams and he's jumped on. He's, and him and a, and a few others are just kind of become sort of regulars where I'm like, I, I don't know what to do for the next episode or I have a few ideas for the next episode. I'll just shoot them a message and be like, hey, you want to come on? And they're usually more than willing as long as they're free. And uh, it's great to have those connections now. Yeah. Yeah, we have a similar thing with I mean, we obviously knew Paul before the the podcast, but he's definitely someone we tap if we just want to mix it up or have some a little different flavor. And then Tom Quee, of course, has come on a lot on the show. I was on yeah. your show, Brandon, two summers ago or maybe last summer. Yeah, it was a couple uh, summers ago. T time is in a strange place for me now. But <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I get is asked. Is time even a thing? <laughs> well, it is a thing. It's a flat circle. So <laughs> that's right. That's, that's the good news and the bad news. One of the things that I get asked about a lot when people either on like podcasts I've guested on to just deal with like rock music, not necessarily Metallica podcasts, but people are interested in the idea that like, oh, there's so many Metallica podcasts. Uh, what's the competitive situation like? And this is something that Tom and yeah. I have talked about and Ethan and I talk about all the time. And the thing that I think has been pretty cool about it is there really hasn't been much of that, at no, least as no. far as I could tell. I mean, yeah. it seemed way more like, ah, let's just work together and help each other and provide different 
slices of pizza in the conversation and um like i, I think because because i think i reached out to you brandon a long like maybe a year ago about coming on the show it just took that long to finally get it yeah. to happen yeah, yeah yeah and then i was on your your thing and like the crossover potential for all of these i think is way cooler than any type of competitive type sitch oh yeah yeah I'm glad you mentioned that because I was actually thinking of that earlier today, knowing that we were going to record tonight. And, you know, I was thinking back to when I first, again, started that Twitter account and recorded that first episode. And I was like, well, there's all these other shows. Like, I don't know how if these shows find out I exist, I don't know how they'll feel. I don't know how <laughs> the listeners will feel. And then like you guys were like instantly cool, like, hey, welcome. And, um, you know, we're instantly support of the show and i quickly realized i'm like oh this is like just a uh an extension of the overall metallica community mm -hmm. and it, it, the cool part is is that you know we all have found i think our own little uh thing to make our shows different obviously there's things that are the same because we're talking about the same band True. but i think you know we have found enough to make things different where we have our own audiences but also there's people who listen to it all you know they listen to both of our shows they listen to tom they listen to metallic chat they listen to speak and destroy they listen to whatever other ones are out there currently you know but <laughs> yeah. it's uh it, it's a really cool community and i agree i don't think there's any you know competitiveness among us like i, I i've never um uh maybe like in a joking way but i've never uh been like oh gotta gotta beat those metal up your podcast boys this month you know <laughs> like it's Good just luck <laughs> and, and and it's you know if anything i see something cool that you guys are doing and i'm like i'm like oh that's really cool i wish i thought of that but then you th come up with your own stuff you know yeah and, and, and just speaking sort of, of that i've been out. meaning to tell you we're changing our name to metallicast by the way the, yeah we, <clears throat> that's perfect i was gonna take really metal cool up your thing. podcast so <laughs> yeah we, we actually brought you on the show to let you know that we're uh sending a cease and desist order and uh, we want you to take down your content as soon as possible. And Q Prime Management will be contacted. I will, yeah, expect, expect a personal visit from Cliff Bernstein and Peter Minch. I do feel like out of all the podcast names, that Metallicast is the best. Yeah, oh, thank you. It's like I think I think that and Speak and Destroy are the, are the two best. Uh, yeah, I, I like Speak and Destroy. It it it's it's like something obvious that I would have never thought of. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I think a lot a lot of times when you start a podcast, much like you know all of us did with the name you instantly go towards like the pun or whatever you want to include the word podcast or cast or something in yeah. it metallic cast was on i still we talked about this in a few a few episodes ago i still have the original list i made of like name ideas even before i think i even hit up clint to to if you wanted to you know do it with me and yeah. Metall metallic cast was one of them actually <laughs> i wonder what you would have called it if we had gone with metallic cast metal up your podcast i guess <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> just flip the coin well it's funny because i remember i i didn't write down a list it, it's just something that sort of like popped in my head one day but like you know you think you're, you're brainstorming a few names i'm like what if i call it the metallica podcast i'm like that's really boring <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it little too on the nose talking you know? talica yeah. and then uh <laughs> yeah talking talica it's actually um, pretty good it's not bad I think I, sure just gave, I think I just helped it's, someone it, name their new Metallica podcast. <laughs> Talk Metallica. <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't already exist, it, it will after this episode. Totally. Is released, yeah. What about the Nutty Podcast? Oh, the Nutty the Nutty Professor podcast. It's just a crossover. <laughs> it's only Metallica and it's only Eddie Murphy movies. I, which, I by prefer the way, if it's I about Norbit it. myself, but you prefer or what? a Norbit guy. I'm more of a Norbit guy. I would prefer if it was uh, Norbit. Norbit and Metallica. Or it's, oh, man. it's, a, it's only uh, Eddie Murphy movies where he plays multiple characters. <laughs> so kind of hey, coming uh, to America is, is good to go. Oh, man. I was trying to uh, think of a Coming to America Metallica crossover podcast. <laughs> what could we, can anyone do it quick? I don't think uh, 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 I have to edit all this out if we can't. Thrashing to America. Close. Um, That's a good shot. There's no Metallica um, song. There's no Metallica song with the word coming yeah. in it. Is there like. Oh, the day that no. never come comes to America. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Okay, I think right. this is the best we're gonna do. So. Well, so obviously, if you're a guy that's gonna start a Metallica podcast, and by the way, keep it up because people don't usually start things and then keep doing them. So the fact that you've started it and you've kept up with it means that you really are pretty committed to it. You're a pretty serious guy when it comes to talking about Metallica. So before we hear your list and stuff, so we already know that you're you're in deep. 
because you're a nerd like us and you you devote a lot of your time to doing this because you know like people who may not know who don't do podcasts how time consuming it can be to, to do a oh, show yeah. consistently yeah. every week no matter what's going on i know you have a young you have an infinite home yeah the world's going crazy uh yeah. a lot of uncertainty in the world and yet you're still cranking out shit every week so that takes a lot of dedication hey the amount of times my wife hears so I'm recording again tonight. Yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> oh, but she's super smart. Right she's here. like, "All right, yeah, go down to the basement and do whatever you want." But I think she's just happy to get rid of me now. But you well, know, yeah, after hope- once quarantine started, you know, <laughs> hopefully our wives can recognize that a little bit of this is medicine, and a little bit of it just gets yeah. us out of their fucking hair for an hour or two. Yeah. Well, totally. well, like I said before, I either talk to you guys about it, or I'm upstairs right now talking to her about it, and she'd much rather watch Netflix. So. <laughs> So here's one thing that we're giving her a break from tonight and all of our wives, maybe. So the boys have been rehearsing at HQ. This has been a big thing. Yeah. And yeah, we, will have, we will have definitely talked about this in the housekeeping, of course. But um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on it, too, Brandon. It, it, there was I got a um, I want to give a shout out to at Bad Wobot, who is a, an Instagram person who sent us a, a screenshot of, I guess it's like an upcoming YouTube list of where they can see what's happening on YouTube or some sort of promo they got where the boys are going to be doing this drive-in theater show. I, sorry, I didn't know anything about this. So I guess some bands are doing some live streams that they're playing in drive-in right. movie theaters. Yeah, yeah. Through like a, a nice loud system. Uh, and it was like kind of in the Chicago area. So that shed a little bit of light on maybe what they're working on. They, they've been tweeting mm. about Howard Stern, a lot of right. Stern faces here, but we're taking rehearsals seriously as in serious radio. Right. <laughs> any, any thoughts or about what's going on with the boys? How nice was it just to see them in the same room together? Oh, I know. It's um, great. it was so nice to see them together, especially seeing James back in action. I mean, obviously he had, uh, he's made a few appearances, but mm-hmm. then, quarantine happened like kind of right when he was back out in public a bit and so it was good to see him doing well and back in action with the boys but uh yeah my initial thought was that they're gonna do a live stream right maybe it'll be a tie-in with like metallica monday you know or maybe it'll be something separate that you uh make more sense i guess if they were charging um you know money to buy uh for like you know a new live show or what have you. So that was my initial thought. And then they sent out all the tweets, like you said, hinting towards Howard Stern. So I'm like, oh, well, I guess that's obvious. Right. But then I, I, I first saw the clue from your Twitter account um, where it looked like a full set. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I'm like, if they're going Howard Stern, they're playing what? Three songs, maybe. Right. Maybe, yeah. if they get given a good amount of time, you know, um, unless they're doing some kind of serious special that Howard Stern's presenting. I don't even know what Howard's been doing during quarantine. I'm kind of a lifelong Howard fan, but I haven't been keeping up with him in the maybe the last year. So I don't know if they've been going into the studio or what. Do do you keep up with Howard Stern, Brandon? I don't know if you do. No. So yeah, so I I don't even know what format he's working with. I don't know. The last time they were there, they did do, they were were doing the Apollo gig in New York. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of promoting that Apollo gig. Um, but the set list looked like 10 to 15 songs and it looked like all greatest hit stuff. So, which I, I got, I got to admit, dudes, I'm not that I'm so excited to see them again, especially in the same room. I mean, just to see yeah. James playing creeping death was like, or battery. There was a video of battery. Yeah, of course yeah. I'm, I share with all of you out there in podcast land, how exciting that is, but just on paper, like they're going to play creep and battery and Sabbath true and fade i don't know how stoked i am for that there wasn't even any hardwired material on the list yeah so i i saw the set that or the songs were kind of released and i honestly had the same reaction because the truth of the matter is if you're if you've been watching metallica mondays every monday yeah totally if you've been following the band's career you have the box that you have like we all do yeah we've heard those songs we've seen those songs yeah and i i would like to see something new but if it's for something like Howard Stern or something for Sirius, it makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, and I was wondering if they're maybe trying to do some kind of like tie in with s 2 I know it's not orchestra related, yeah. but maybe they'll go on Howard that morning or that week and just like bash out a bunch of greatest hits and just do yeah. something kind of funky like that. You know, it makes sense. Yeah, maybe so. <clears throat> I do like uh, 
uh, like we mentioned James earlier, I mean, this is kind of the first time besides that, like black and video, the acoustic version they did, plus uh, the Reclaim Rust appearance. The Peterson Museum, yeah. Peterson Museum. He had uh, that Eddie Money thing too. That yeah, he, uh, he went and played the Eddie Money thing. Yeah, that's but right. this is kind of, this is the first time really we've seen him like with an Explorer on, with the boys yeah. in person since he left for rehab. And that was yeah. almost a year ago. How about this? A lot of heat. A lot of some of it joking, but some of it real heat. Paying attention to him not wearing a mask in the video, and it's it's real hard not just to be like he's the singer. He has to. <laughs> he's a he has to sing now. I would imagine too, because all those. I mean, everyone but Lars, li- you know, mainly lives in other areas of the country. Yeah. Uh, I would guarantee if it was like, hey, okay, we're still in the in the in the thick of this pandemic. I would be shocked if. Uh, James and Kirk didn't fly private to San Francisco. And I, bet you James, his... I bet you James drove. I guarantee James you. James could have driven. He yep. probably just did a road trip, and I'm sure yeah. he has a nice car. Um, the man <laughs> yeah. likes cars. Um, even if right. he didn't use one of those daily driver type things, I'm sure he's got some kind of sick fucking SUV. Yeah. He probably drove. Now, Kirk would have had to have flown, and I'm sure Robert drove too because he was just in LA. Yeah. I mean, I, Kirk, yeah. Kirk could have, he could have taken a jet ski. <laughs> he could have taken a submarine. I don't. I, I don't want to leave submarines out. He could That's have. True. He, he might have a. He, he might have ridden on the back of Cthulhu. Submarine. He could have just <laughs> caught in a ride with Cthulhu. Cthulhu, the take USS me to Cthulhu. County. Yeah. Uh, I think that they were wearing masks in the video as some sort of solidarity. They don't need to wear the masks in there. I guarantee yeah. you, they're not just wearing masks in there the whole rehearsal. I think right, they were like, yeah. "Hey, let's shoot a promo for the thing we're doing, and they'll put a mask on." And James was like, "No." <laughs> And Lars right. is like, cool, no problem. Because well, the, in, too, in the I mean, battery video, Kirk's not, I don't think Kirk or Robert are wearing a mask. No, just Lars in that one. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that. But in the Creeping Death one, they all were. They yeah. all are, except James, yeah. yeah. I think as well, I mean, there's obviously uh, some crew is there. I'd imagine maybe Chad. I don't know if he flew out for that, probably. Um, and there's obviously people filming and stuff like that. They're such a high, high profile band and under such lock and key with certain things. I would imagine this has been planned for a while and management reached out to whatever crew was involved. Being like, all right, guys, quarantine like, or whatever. Yeah, quarantine. Everyone get tested before you know, uh, before we yeah. fly you out, or or fly out. We're gonna get you tested here. We're gonna make sure that everyone's good to go because it's like, do you want to be the guy that get, give that gives James Hetfield <laughs> COVID nineteen, <laughs> or no. or gives it right, to Lars well, and Lars gives it to Torben, or you know, just the domino effect. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So yeah, I mean, you're besides... right. They were like mandatory colonoscopies for everyone coming to HQ. <laughs> yeah, totally. Just for fun. Uh, I also was thinking that because besides, I mean, let's put all, the obvious health and importance of that to the side. Like, do you think Q Prime wants to lose their right the money of Ex- whatever totally the They're, press and right, all yeah. that stuff that you know is tied to this band? That, that's that, just too yeah, much on the line. That thing too generates much on the line. It generates millions for so many. Yeah. You know, for yeah, a lot of people depend on this machine. And I'm sure, I mean, if we want to just go back a little bit to, I mean, it's been a, since James had to go to rehab, it's been a pretty crazy litany of disappointing announcements, right? Because they, yeah. you could tell they were kind of rolling them out just at, on a wait and see basis. But it was, so first of all, it was like the all within my hands gig done. Then it was like, remember that, that festival schedule got rescheduled because James had like a sobriety weekend and yeah. people were flipped right, about yeah. that dude. Like, what the fuck? Um, Australia, South America got canceled. It's just been a really disappointing ten months with that, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. and I I remember even then I'm sure it's documented on the episodes, but before COVID didn't happen, like thinking about the business, just the the business part of that, where they're like, oh, we don't, we can't lose these tours, but we have to protect the thing that makes to really put it in crude economic terms, we have to protect this thing that makes us millions of dollars over the spans oh, yeah. of years so if we have to take a year where it's real lean for them uh i'm sure they were willing to do it it makes a lot of sense to me but goddamn, it's got to be hard when you're used to that thing just making millions a year yeah yeah totally i mean i guess the good part of it is is that i'm hoping that by next summer we're all kind of good and a better place and things will just sort of will roll over mm. to the next calendar year i'm hoping like we saw the announcement of one of the festivals. I forget which one it is. Yeah. Tell me. Maybe it was Aftershock. Yeah, the one for October next year. The, the, it was, yeah. It's the California one, right? So then I, I, I speculated on my show. Um, I was like, I wonder if, you know, we'll see more announcements for the other festivals maybe pop up for next summer. Just sort of, you know, same bill or similar bill. And Right. Um, but yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a huge blow. But I mean, 
you know, you guys know more than I do being in the middle of, you know, the music industry and being mm-hmm. touring musicians, you know, just how it's uh, called the biz, by the way, <laughs> the biz. I'm sorry. Yeah. I forgot since I, dude, we sent you a glossary. See, I, we sent you a glossary before the episode <laughs> yeah. started. Like right now we're not on deck. You know what that means? Come on. <laughs> Once you become a music teacher, you're officially out of the biz. So, <laughs> okay, fair. No, you're no, you're a part of the biz that actually makes money. You're you're actually in real business. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, but you're right. So I think what you were asking is like maybe what the forecast actually looks like. It's pretty bleak. It's pretty rough. I mean, yeah. summer of next year is probably uh, honestly kind of optimistic. Not not yeah. impossible, but optimistic. Yeah, it really I, depends I, for, on the vaccine and how that how that goes. But I think even with the vaccine getting 50,000 people in a stadium, I think is going to be tough. I think a lot of big acts like Metallica, like Taylor Swift, I know some of my friends in that camp are saying it might even be 2022, but yeah, um, they don't know, by the way. I'm not saying yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope right, Loudwire yeah. doesn't fucking post that. In fact, I might just <laughs> edit that out. But, um, but I think that a big band like Metallica is even going to have to scale back their production value because I, I don't think stadiums mm-hmm. are going to make sense. And I, yeah. think in a, well, I think in some way it's almost kind of cool because... I was thinking about this honestly more in terms of Taylor Swift than Metallica, but it applies in that because Taylor Swift just put out this really cool kind of indie folk record. And it would be so cool to see her in theaters again. Like she could do like 10 nights at the Ryman. Sorry, Ethan, I don't want to trigger you here, but (sighs) imagine seeing Metallica like do a tour where they just did (laughs) instead of doing a big stadium, which would endanger a lot of people, they could do a more distanced, smaller run. Weren't the Foo Fighters going to do this a van tour? Uh, well, they, uh, they, they weren't actually going to be in a van, I don't think. Why were they, they calling were, it a van tour? Like, what was well, that? They were basically playing the exact same uh, cities as their very first tour 25 uh, years ago. That's not quite a van tour, is it? I think they were calling it a van tour. Because they were playing the arenas when they, they played the shitty club and they're in their buses and jets. <laughs> right. And, shit. and now they're but, in their jet, yeah. But it's, but, it's the, but it's also the Foo Fighters. You know that they probably like will space out the shows where they, in each of those small towns, they do like a surprise show at a yeah, random yeah, local yeah. bar or something. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right, cool. Well, so let's get a sense of sorry to bring said. it down guys no 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 no. we i think we try to have a balance of talking about covid uh i think we try not to talk about it a lot because people maybe go to these podcasts to get away from it a little bit but yeah totally there are also people out there who want to know our, our thoughts about it including yours brandon and as a father and as a music teacher and someone being in a kind of a hot spot of the virus yeah so trying to balance all that i think is good i think we just did a good i think pivoting from it now is a great it's a great opportunity <laughs> And Q transition. <laughs> um, so let's get a sense of where you're at with the album rankings. We just revisited our rankings a few weeks ago, which was fun to kind of see a couple of years ago what changed. We did have some changes, some interesting changes. Yeah. Some of the big things didn't change. So I'm curious before we hear your list, is this a list that has been pretty similar for you, most of your fandom? Or is this list, no. as you wrote it down, you're like, holy shit, a lot's changed. Yeah, I, this is an always evolving list. Um I would say my top three, pretty much. I, I would say my top three albums stay the same. Mm-hmm. The number two and three spot might flip depending on what day you ask me. Mm-hmm. Right. But the top three albums stay the same. Um, but after that, it depends on if you're in a Saint Anger or a Lulu mood. We know. We yeah. know how that goes, bro. <laughs> oh yeah, this is top eleven because Lulu has to be in there. <laughs> Brandon, did, I did. He did. Ask I did me, reach yeah. out. I'm like, wait, are we including this? Like, are we including the S and M's and Lulus of the world, or are we just? Is, and he said, just the ten studio. So yeah, I think if we included um, at the first S and M, it might be like top three for me. Maybe it'd be top five for sure for me. Yeah, I, I would put it up there too for me. And then Garage Garage uh, Inc. Disc One would be really high for me too. Yeah, it'd probably Same. be higher than like Death Magnetic. Maybe I hate to say that, but it, it probably it's would. Good. And I bet for a lot of people, a lot of like maybe OGs, trues, Garage Days Re Revisited would be really high. Like yeah, maybe sure. above Black Album for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. So for all those obvious reasons, we're not. <laughs> hey, did you guys get the? Um, uh, w- there were some emails where they they re- they released uh, the Moth and the Flame from S N M two and Nothing Else Matters. Yeah, yeah, sounds pretty good. Dude, I'm pretty it, excited. Been, sounds good. I've been gnawing at the bit for any S N M two clips that are officially right, released. The, right, so you hear the actual the actual audio. mix and all that goodness. But uh, yeah, I've I've really been enjoying it. And when we get to the next list, I think I'll probably touch upon that a little bit. But 
Cool. All right. Well, so let's start. So let's do it from 10 to 1. And uh, let's hear what your album rankings are. All right. So like I said, this is always changing really outside of my top three. But number 10, Sane Anger. What? Uh, I know it's a shocker. It's a hot take. Uh, I, to be honest, I <laughs> to be honest, I like this album. Yeah. It, it, um, it just, you know, it's not the same to me, obviously, as a Ride the Lightning or a Master Puppets or even a load or it, it it's just it it's last on the list but it's still an album i enjoy i think i realized recently that it's i like the album more for what it represents than a lot of the actual songs on it like i'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that time period of the band where they yeah. were going through all that stuff and i and i think if you take the album and you pair it up with some kind of monster and there's this great book i don't know if you guys have checked it out yet from um joe berlinger one of the directors of some kind of monster called this monster lives yeah which just kind of takes you behind the scenes of the movie those three things to me are if you're a metallica nerd like us it's like a perfect companion piece and kind of gives you better understanding of the making of the album and you know what the band was going through and i and i'm really fascinated by the creative process for artists that i like um so for that reason, I appreciate Saint Anger, and there are songs on there that I think are very underrated songs, like "Unnamed Feeling," mm-hmm. "All Within My Hands." Um, it, but yeah, it, it, it's last on my list for um, it. The songs just are not up to par to the rest of the album. I, I think all speaking. of that was super well said. I couldn't agree more. Like the, it's interesting because the era it's tied to, and like the context of that album, is what kind of saves it, and makes it cool. There's a lot of what I term spiritual significance to the record. They may not even be a band uh, currently if they hadn't have gone through that. But at the same time, it's kind of what also underscores what doesn't work about it because great records don't need to be tied to some dramatic non-music part for them to make sense. Like, Mm -hmm. No one cares about what was happening during Blood on the Tracks, even though I guess Dylan was getting... It's like, who cares? The songs are great. It's a great album. Ride Ride the Lightning, who cares what the story is? It's got Creeping Death on it. Yeah, <laughs> the stories are relevant. Exactly. The stories in the in the track list. So exactly, and for the average person out there, I mean, like I said, I find better understanding watching the movie, reading the. The average person out there does not give a shit about any of that, right? They just want to hear the songs, right? You're, they're not they're not a nerd like me. They're not going to jump into things as uh, heavily as me, perhaps. You know, so I, I completely get it. Um, but yeah. For me, it's more of the experience of the album, I guess, yeah. than uh, the overall album itself. Yeah, right on. I'm with you. Shocking shocking number 10, but I accept it. <laughs> <laughs> now, my number nine is Reload. I'm uh, actually a oh. really big fan of the Load Reload era. And if you were to ask me this, you know, a year ago, I think Load Reload would have been higher on my list. I'm just sort of kind of going where my mental state is now with the band and sort of what I've been listening to the most. You followed your so, heart, bro. You followed your heart. Reload is at nine. Um, but again, so many great tracks on that record that I think get overlooked. Um, I know you guys are fans of Fixer. Mm-hmm. That's sort oh, of yeah. a legendary song in the Metallica catalog because, you know, it's never been performed live and it's such an epic track. Um, but beyond that, you know, I I love I love the singles. I love the singles like memory, memory remains, remains is one of Ethan's fuel. favorite Metallica songs. Oh, yeah, love it. yeah. I mean, of course. And yeah. that, and that song live is just phenomenal. And Absolutely. You have everybody doing the Marian faithful part. And um, with that said, I think that it has a couple of the weakest songs in their catalog. I think better than you is probably the worst single that they've ever released um, in terms of just like radio singles. Um, there's some songs I don't know if they've aged as well, even though I like, I like Prince charming, but it's, I can I can take it or leave it. Um, but, you know, other tracks like Low Man's Lyric and I'm really I, I, I've i always loved Carpe Diem Baby. There's a lot of mm-hmm. deep cuts in that album that I really, really dig. But I again, ask me six months from now, I might be higher. But today <laughs> it's number nine. I do have to give a I do have to give to sort of a mandatory boo. I do have to just mildly <laughs> boo Reload being number nine just yeah, for the some... sake of the pedigree of the podcast. Because everything you said makes a lot of sense. You went with your heart and you broke Clint's. <laughs> Dude, the first time I was ever on Alpha Metallica, it was to talk about Better Than You. 
<laughs> and yeah. And Tom hates reload. He hates better than you. Oh, he yeah. hates reload. Yeah. And I I actually love better than you. I don't I don't know why, but I love it. And he asked me, he's like, he's talking about he we got to like Kirk's solo and he was like, I mean like are you proud of Kirk with his solo? Does this solo make you proud? I'm like, what are you talking about, Tom? I've never been proud of Kirk, except for maybe when he helped donate money with the All Within My Hands Foundation to the fucking forest fires or something. That was the only time I was proud of Kirk. Anyway. I, I will oh say gosh. this. If I if I just go to my phone and put Shuffle on Metallica and Better Than You comes on, I'm not skipping it. Hell yeah. Okay. There we go. Right. You know, sounds, like you go. Need, sounds like it may need to move higher on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight, I put Death Magnetic. Okay. Um, Death Magnetic is, I, I love the album. When I, I remember when I first heard it, I was like, it's, you know, it's a return to the old days. Uh, I think a lot of people felt that way. But to be honest, I just, in recent years, I don't revisit the album as much as, uh, uh, as I thought I would maybe when it first came out. And yeah. I think part of it is because I just think Hardwired was so damn good hmm. um, that it just sort of uh, it, it, it almost ruined that album a little bit for me because I was so excited about Death Magnetic. And then eight years later, we got Hardwired. I was like, but this is so much better. <laughs> That's my opinion. It's also but, an intense album. I mean, it's it, it's a it's a commitment to dip into. Yeah. That yeah, album. it's a long record. The songs are very long, much much like Justice or whatever. And yeah, um, I, I've always called it Justice Part. It's like Justice Part Two. I feel yeah, like. absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know, like Sonic Sonic issues aside, um, it, it, you can get a little bit of that fatigue if you listen to that that record front to back. It, it, if you're actually sitting down and paying attention to it, if I throw it on my record player, you know, while I'm getting ready in the morning or making breakfast or whatever, like I knew I you were going to say, I th- I would have guessed, I would have voted for making eggs, but you just said breakfast. But I <laughs> breakfast, which includes I could have finished that sentence, bro. Listen, I do most of my <laughs> vinyl listening late at night or first thing in the morning. What's your favorite song on Death Magnetic, Brandon? If you if you could just spitball one, a hot take, if you will. My, I would say, you know what? I I've always been a sucker for. This is probably an unpopular choice, but I've always been a second for Broken Beat and Scarred. Mm, that's a great uh, song. I, I like the riff. I like the melody. Um, it takes a couple of twists and wacky twists and turns, as our favorite Danish drummer would say. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think I'd go with Broken Beat and Scarred. And I think that that's a song that I think translates really well live that I would love to hear them pull out more. You know what I think is pretty cool is we've covered some of the DVD releases from kind of the World Magnetic era. We were pretty yeah. lucky to get a lot of cool official releases from that tour and oh, yeah. see a yeah. lot of the they pretty much played the whole album live, except for maybe Suicide and Redemption and maybe Unforgiven Three a handful of times. But on, yeah. on like Quebec Magnetic and uh the Nemes gig, they played a lot of like mm-hmm. Broken Bean Scar things on Judas Kiss, All Nightmare Long, My Apocalypse. Yeah. It's pretty when cool. I, when I saw them on that tour, I mean there was what, six or seven songs from Death Magnetic at the time. Yeah. In the set. Opening yeah. opening with that was just your life right into end of yeah. the line, just like the album. Awesome. And that's when they were really mixing up the set night to night. Yeah. Like i I feel like on the World Wire tour, you kind of got a more standard set. They had the rotating slots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it you, you kind of the, the signature songs were all there night to night, you know. But right. on the Death Magnetic tour, there was every night was different. You maybe you heard bells, maybe you didn't. Maybe you heard you wow. know, outside yeah. of like one puppet Sandman. I don't know if there was any songs that they pulled out every night. Nothing else matters, probably. But yeah, you know, outside of like those four kind of standards, you know. Yeah. So that was a really fun tour, and yeah, they, I, I remember they would just sort of circle through all those songs throughout the cycle, um, and that was really neat. Yeah. All right. Number seven. Number seven, I went with, uh, you know, I, it's funny. I have something else written, and in my mind, I, I was thinking something else. I'm, 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 I'm going to change it on the spot here. Oh, okay. My number <laughs> seven oh. is, uh, this is a I, maybe an unpopular hot take for some of you, uh, Metal Police, who I know you're a big fans of on this show, <laughs> yeah. um, Injustice for All. Oh, boy. Wow. wow. Okay. Yeah, that's wow. Okay. I mean, hey, wow. Ask me again, again, tomorrow. It'll probably be my top four, but <laughs> I'm calling you right while I'm now. making eggs tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brandon, it's the next day. Where's Justice? He's going to be listening to Justice while I'm it's up to number five today. Eggs. Ask me again tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Well, what, yeah. What do you? What, so what? What was going through your head just now that that, that demoted it? Because it, I, I basically flipped it with. Um, 
Well, let me tell my next album, then I'll go into that because I, I basically flipped it with my next album. Okay. Um, at, at number six, I put Load. And I just have such a soft spot in my heart for Load. I just love that album. And for me, like the Black Album was the first album I ever had by Metallica. But Load was my second album. I was in sixth grade when that album came out. It was I like I remember sixth grade. I got my first CD player. It was the first CD I ever owned. Um, and, you know, I, I, I discovered Metallica at an early age because I had two older brothers who had MTV on and stuff. So I remember seeing Inter Sandman, you know, when it was new and hearing when it was new. And but, you know, up until I, like sixth grade, I thought the Black Album Mode were the only two Metallica albums that existed. Yeah. Um. So and, and I just love I love that record. I do. And uh, for me, the. The experience, the personal experience I had with that record just pushes it up past justice, which I know is an unpopular opinion, but I like that though. I, I appreciate it. It's definitely you definitely have justice lower than me, even though I'm kind of known as a load reload guy. Yeah. But I dig that. How much of a shame is it that there's no load representation live anymore? They might play it's King Nothing, shame. maybe. But it's, it's either I mean, fuel or memory. Maybe. It's a shame. It's a shame. I would even yeah. love to see until it sleeps again live. Me too. It was a huge hit. I yeah, I huge mean, hit. When I when I look at the load track list, there are like bleeding me. I would put up there with their best. To me, that's one of my all time favorite. Mm -hmm. songs. Totally agree. Um, Outlaw Torn. You know, they they it's cool. They pulled it out once in the World Wire Tour. Obviously, they did again in S and M too. Uh, but and I know that's a deep cut. But, you know, they're, they're pulling out deep cuts on these shows. Yeah. I would love to hear it more. I think that's one of their best. Um, even I, I, even when they took risk on this record, like Mama said, it was completely different type of ballad for them. I love that song. Me too. Um, yeah. and, and I think what attracts me to Load uh, over Injustice for All is just, you know, when you, I love James's lyrics on it. I love his voice on it. It's just such a, it seems like such a personal record. Um, and there's so many songs that if I'm just, if I have a half hour to listen to whatever Metallica songs I want, I'm not necessarily going to justice and getting through two songs. Ooh. I'm going more to like load. And, you guys hear? You know. I, I think I hear the sirens already. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're distance, right. Even though, Shoot, I think I be hear cool. Them. Be cool. Be cool. <laughs> Listen, it, wait. I hear a knock. I think they're at the Eat door. Your drugs. But, uh, Eat your drugs. Eat your drugs. Eat your drugs. <laughs> quick, quick. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's my reasoning though. All right, I love it, dude. This is a killer list so far. So what's yeah. coming in at number five? So here we go into the top five. So you've already you've already put load and reload. You've already got those those dudes crossed out. So it's and sort justice. of a battle of the classics here. Although you do have a classic at number seven, so that's interesting. Yeah, number five. I I went with the latest one, Hardwired to Self Destruct. Um, you know, it's a few years after its release. I still revisit it all the time. Um, I think there are so many great songs. I think it's perhaps their best produced song, uh, album um, to date. I, I love the sound of the record. I, I love how the guitar sound. I love how the bass sounds. I love how James vocals sound. Um, and there's just so many great songs, especially in the first half. The first, yeah. first half I mean, from Hardwired through Halo on Fire. That's all those songs from are just classic Metallica. And when you go yeah. to side two, even the it's funny because the first time I heard the album, I was like, side two is kind of weak with a couple exceptions. And then the more I listen to it, I'm like, I really like Confusion. Yeah. I, I really like Here Here Comes Revenge. Yeah, I really like all these songs, you know, and and now having lived with the album for a few years, I can't imagine not having those songs. Man Unkind, this might be an unpopular opinion again. Maybe you want to call the metal police again, but hey, I don't um, call them, bro. You call I, them. Hey, you call them with your opinions, dude. I don't I, want them around. They just come. I love Man Unkind. For the I, first I time I heard that yeah. track, I was like, that was that's been one of my favorite tracks on the record. Yeah, and I love that song. It, it just has such a great Sabbath feel at parts, and it's just takes so many left turns, and I, I just really love that track. And uh, it's kind of an argument for the hardware being sort of a return to black album form, right? Because yeah. side B of the black album, when you compare it to side A, you're like, are these songs just not as good? But if you just take it away from side A through the never and wolf and man and like the songs on side B yeah. and, and, and the God that failed and my friend of misery, oh those would have been yeah. the, the, any other band. Those would have been the best songs on yeah. that on whatever album they made. Oh, yeah. They just happened yeah. to put on the black album. 
and, and side A's like that on Hardwired with Moth, Halo, Now That We're Dead, Atlas, Dream No yeah. More. Side B's killer, yeah. but when you compare it to side A, it's like, it's tough. But then they've got the yeah. one yeah. spit out the bone is kind of like the, not stylistic wise, but in terms of like heavy hitting, it's like the nothing else matters of side B. Yeah. Well, it's like spit out the bone was the song that every like true, everybody who's hated this band since Cliff Burden died, right? <laughs> yeah. They, I feel like they heard that song. They're like, fine. Right, yeah. That, that song's pretty cool. But yeah, yeah, that song's not bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, like and nobody could ignore like just how badass spit out the bone. Was. But those yeah, guys yeah. haven't heard a lot of the middle records because they've been too busy working on the police force, the metal police force. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. They got that's jobs true. right outside Very of 84, true. like right after lightning, they got gigs as the metal police. So. <laughs> it is interesting when, when, when hardware came out and uh, a lot of those like old school fans, the trues were like, finally, like the thrash song. Double blah, blah. Kick. And every time I ever hear that, I think, did you not listen to death magnetic? Yeah. Like if anything, there's, there's more thrash stuff on that than there is hardwired. Yeah, exactly. To me, hardwired is not really a return to, the thrash roots even though you have spit out the bone you have hardwired the song and obviously elements of that but to me hardwired takes everything that they've done before you have the thrash of the first four records you have like the arena anthems of the black album you have the groove of load and reload yeah it just takes everything that they've done and meshes it together i've always songs are really good yeah totally i've always called it uh like it's 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 the best of Metallica stylistically. It yeah, covers totally. the whole spectrum. Totally. All right, number four. So number four is obviously a classic album. It is, uh, but to be honest, it's one that I would probably normally put lower on my list. Um, that album is Kill 'Em All. Okay. Um, I I but lately I've been gravitating toward this album more. Um, I think it's been a combination of, uh, you know, seeing some of the older shows on Metallica Mondays and sort of revisiting uh, more of these songs in the live set. I think it's and also just it's a, a lot of I've noticed when I was putting together my song list and stuff like a lot of my current opinions are kind of dictated by what I have going on on Metallica. It's so like recently I interviewed like Johnny Z. Um, and when I and I just like dove head first into Kill 'Em All era Metallica, you know, yeah. uh, in preparation for talking to him. And so I, it, it just moved farther up my list. Obviously, it's a classic album. It changed metal. Uh, but normally I, I would probably have it lower. But, yeah, it's moved up my list in recent months. I have the same thing. For me, it was just the, the anniversary happened a few weeks ago. And right. so yeah. I just threw it on vinyl in the studio and then just really loved it. And just mm -hmm. when the side ended, I just kept turning it side A, side B, side A, side B. Yeah, yeah. Had a good time with it. I think, Ethan, you came over during some of that, and I was just cranking Kill 'em All. Yeah. Because that's what was happening. And that, that traditionally has been one of my least favorites. I think it's, I, I, I think what I appreciate about it more is more than any Metallica record, it's fun. I think it's probably their most fun album. Hmm, that's just, a good point. Yeah. Really, it's it obviously it's all up tempo, high energy. It's definitely it's just fun. this innocence to it, um, and it's hard to take it all that seriously. Even though there's obviously serious songs on it, it's great songwriting, but it's hard to take it as seriously as like you know when you hear Phantom Lord, or when you hear Nori Morris and they're talking about you know swords are like lightning, and yeah. it, it's just it, it's a little bit more cliche. There, there um, are like fifteen previous, references the, to wearing leather on that album. Exactly, so, you know, <laughs> metal militia. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's just a fun album. It's definitely, you know, lyrically more cliche than anything else they would do. But it, that's what makes it fun. That's part of its charm, and it, it just yeah. captures sort of their innocence of being. Like I can picture eighteen-year-old James and Lars just bashing out these songs um, as they're writing them. Right, and nude. Yeah, uh, for sure. In, in the new, I, may only, I add only, nude. <laughs> yeah. only wearing le le leopard print gloves. Just leopard gloves, right? <laughs> and, and, and leopard diapers, by the way. That's right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> All right. Top three. All right. Top three. So, like I said, my top three don't change. My number two and three spot might flip flop, uh, but my top three don't change. Number three is Ride the Lightning. Um, it went, the first time I heard this album, because after, you know, after I realized the Black Album Load were not the only two Metallica records, I went back, did my homework, educated myself, checked out the old records. And the first time I heard Ride the Lightning, it blew me away. Yeah. Um, it, and it, I mean, you just look at the track listing and it's just 
classic after classic from start to finish. Um, but it, it was not doesn't hold the same spot in my heart as my number two album, which is the Black Album. Hmm. Um, that was the yeah. first Metallica record I ever heard. Um, you know, I think for millions of people, it's sort of their gateway to the band and their gateway into heavy metal in general. And that was totally it for me. I, I had that cassette when I was in third grade. Yeah, nice. Um, and I, it, right next to probably my Vanilla Ice single. And uh, <laughs> I had that. I had Ice Ice Baby. <laughs> what was the B, and, what was uh, the B side of that? I think it was. Uh, oh, I have to go back and look now. I think it was. Uh, Shit. Go ninja, go ninja, go. <laughs> that was later, dude. That was that was the fucking secret uh, of the ooze, man. Ninja rap. Man, what was it? I I would have, dude. I would have been able to tell oh, you that. Oh, I, I think I actually know what it was. I think it was play that funky play the music. funky music, white boy. I was. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Another huge single from one Mister V Ice. <laughs> <laughs> Mister Ice himself. <laughs> Mister Robert Van Winkle. Obviously, we're metalheads here, so we prefer the new metal era of Vanilla Ice as. Oh you yeah! Know, did Gosh, he do new for, metal? I didn't even yeah. know that. Oh, he did a whole remake of Ice Ice Baby. You need to check that oh out. Oh my god! Wow. You don't really. It, I wouldn't say you oh, need to check it out. <laughs> no one That's really needs to. Is. But if you if you have a hankering one day for some new metal <laughs> and vanilla ice, <laughs> hey, for making yeah. eggs one morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Top of yeah. All right, so that would make your number one, of course, puppets. Then puppets. Which, I, that's I, Ethan's number one. If yeah. I'm, if I'm not wrong, I just think it's. I just think it's the perfect album. It really uh, is. Like for me, I hear Ride the Lightning and I'm like, this album was phenomenal. Like I said, it blew my mind. It set the blueprint for basically the next two records, right? But the Master Puppets just perfected it. And I, I, if nobody had ever heard Metallica, I could put on the song Master Puppets. And I think that in over that eight minutes, that tells them who Metallica are. Yeah, it's like mm-hmm. it's definitely in contention for their greatest song, along with along with one and blackened. Yeah. Like I just think those I just think like Master captures everything they do great as a band. It has yeah. the fast heavy, the the groove heavy, the melody, the lyrics, the complex arrangement with the beautiful interlude in the middle. And right. It even has a backwards guitar solo. It, it's just it has everything in eight minutes, and it doesn't feel like an eight-minute song. I just thought of a great analogy. Ride the Lightning is like Jordan, but playing for North Carolina. And he hits that <laughs> shot exactly. against Georgetown that basically sets the destiny for his entire career. Puppets right. is like Jordan in like winning Rookie of the Year on the Bulls. It's not quite right. the Black... The yeah. Black Album would be Jordan's first championship in 91. But... Puppets is like Jordan in the pros winning the slam dunk contest, flying through the air like a fucking alien. Would Saint Anger be <laughs> Jordan playing for the Barons? No, no, Saint no, Saint Anger is Jordan playing for the Wizards. Yeah, that's true. I, that's true. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, what was his minor league album? Uh, was dude, I'm wearing the jersey album? right now, bro. This is Jordan's jersey, dude. Yeah, <laughs> Birmingham, Birmingham Barons. <laughs> there you go. So wait, yeah, so wait, the Saint Anger is his Wizards a- album. You said that's got to be when he went back to the Wizard. I, I I don't know what his, I don't know what his baseball stint would be in the Metallica world. Maybe the We Did It Again, uh, Ja Rule <laughs> collab. <laughs> you know what's sad is that between Metallica and Tom had me on for an episode of his a while back. So between our two shows, I've done two episodes on We Did It Again. <laughs> Who voluntarily does that? Wow. To themselves? How much is Who there to say about it other that? than that it's not we good? We couldn't get we couldn't well, get it's through funny. That part of that episode fast enough. <laughs> it, it's funny because Richard, as he again, I shout him out before. He's been a frequent guest. He wrote that article on Saint Anger, so he, I had him come on. We did a Saint Anger track by track, and I said, "Hey, man, if you're willing, hang out a little bit longer, and we'll record like a quick mini episode about we did it again." And I'll just throw it out like you know, with the episode. We talked for forty five minutes. Wow. <laughs> About so we like, did it again. I'm like, I'll just, I guess I'll just count this as the next episode. But it, what do we talk about? I mean, we really analyzed the lyrics of Ja Rule. Wow. Um, wow. Picked them apart. Uh, we wondered why it was. I, now, see, now I'm forgetting the lyric off the top of my head. The rap police are going to be after me, you know, because they all hold uh, that song in high regard. Oh, but, yeah. Um, right. Uh, it, it, there's a line like, bragging about driving like 55 on the highway i'm like that's under oh, the speed dude. limit on most highways you know like <laughs> dude that's yeah. even even sammy hagar couldn't do that 
He yeah. had a whole hit song about how he couldn't drive 55. I couldn't do that. Dude, talk about shitty lyrics. Here's the first opening gambit lyric of that song. One foot on the brake and one on the gas. Yeah. That's I can't drive 55, dude. Foot and then on the ga- brake, foot on the gas. Yeah. Which is not a great way to drive. You, you don't hit yeah. both pedals at the same Kinda time. Kind of cancels each other out a little bit. I, I, I think he's saying he's ready to do either. <laughs> Maybe so. I might are we, think are we that, about that to do 45 might... minutes on I Can't Drive 55? Maybe that we might are. also be the reason why he can't Welcome drive to 55. Welcome to Metal Gear Because he's driving wrong. <laughs> Dude, Sammy, we have identified the problem. you got to do one or the other, bro. Sammy, yeah. seriously. That is a dilemma. And just use one, <laughs> I bet you, foot, one foot I bet you Jeru could help him out. Yeah. Well, yeah. He could help him out. He, we did it again. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about we that, did it again again. <laughs> I think my the most awkward... Oh, there's a lot of awkward parts that we did again, but I think the most awkward part is when they edited in James Nevermore, your whipping boy. Yeah. Like it has nothing to do with anything going on in that song. It's a pretty rough collaboration. It really yeah. is. I wish it weren't, but it just is. It just is, yeah. All right. All right so let's move on we- before I do a third episode about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we just started one. We could cut it off short. Yeah. So now <laughs> on to the, I would argue, more revealing top ten, which yeah. is not the top 10 you'd play for an alien. Not the top 10 that you think uh, would impress the metal police. Your personal top 10 Metallica songs. So I think, Ethan, ours had all kinds of weird surprises, right? Mine had, like, Attitude. Yeah. The closing, or not the closing, the closing kind of rock song on Reload. What were some of the weird ones on your list, Ethan? Do you remember, like, a... a I, had, I, had, I had three of the three instrumentals, instrumentals on mine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, and this is something that's, that's ever-changing. I mean... I yeah. could have I could have made another list the next day and it probably would have changed. But you didn't. I didn't. I, I kept true to my word. So my list is a little crazy because good. I approached it as not all time, but as oh like, fuck! Right. I just realized we did it again. Might be on Brandon's list. Oh my gosh! It <laughs> just <laughs> dawned on me. <laughs> Holy it shit! Can Spoiler be. alert: It's not okay. But I, I approached it as like ten songs of theirs that if I if I if I was going to listen to 10 metallic songs right now, here's what I would prefer to listen to. That's it. That's the list. Um, so yeah, there's, it, I think there's a lot of, there might be some surprises on here. Uh, I definitely stray from some of the standards, if you will. Good. Uh, so no, should I start number? Yeah, let's go. Number 10 let's here? jump in. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so number 10 is kind of a standard classic track, motor breath. Okay. Um, you know, again, I've been kind of going down the kill them all road and uh that's just such a short fun short and sweet short and sweet love it. it's basically their punk rock song yeah absolutely number nine number nine first left turn maybe is uh rebel of babylon wow Ooh. some uh, beyond magnetic beyond love. magnetic yeah so i just did uh my most recent metallic cast episode that came out was actually uh a look at all four songs on beyond magnetic and that was sort of the first time i had listen to all those four songs in a row um in Ooh, metal police i, I think the um, sirens are in the distance <laughs> i think i hear them oh shit <laughs> but rebel of babylon uh the four songs definitely stands out to me and uh uh there's a rumored lane steely connection with the lyrics yeah, right um and seems to be about it, drug addiction and yeah and, and i've and i discovered when i really jumped into all four of these songs there's a lot of that that creeps into all four of these so it kind of gives you kind of a uh, uh a hint as to where james's headspace was but right yeah rebel babylon i think that's a really that's a killer choice man that that is definitely i think my my favorite I, i'd have to go with hell and back is my favorite beyond magnetic song but rebel of babylon is for sure killer very yeah. eerie it's also yeah. one of the long it's like i think it's in the top three or four longest metallica songs right, right. like so suicide and redemption and puppets and to live is to die yeah, it's super I just long. Love, it's like nine minutes. I love the melody and the verses, and I, I think it's a little bit different than like your standard Metallica track in a lot mm. of ways. Could you see it on Death Magnetic? Like, or any of those songs on that EP? Could you see as sort of maybe replacing? Uh, I don't know, Judas Kiss or Suicide and Redemption or something. Maybe this one, maybe taking the place of the instrumental, um, but not really. I, I it's funny when I listened back to this. EP, I was like, I like all four songs. They're both solid, but they're both not to me at the level most of the other Death Magnetic material is. Um, I, I I feel like, you know, they always talk about how they kind of like 
finesse material for load and reload. Right. I think they could have like kind of finessed these songs a little bit more yeah. and maybe done something with them. But it's like, you know, why force it? With that said, I think for leftovers, so to speak, um, these are really solid. Yeah. Um, very solid leftovers for sure. And uh, it, it just shows you like it makes me wonder, like, did they write anything that didn't make the cut? Like what what's what's the C level songs? Because I think the B level songs are pretty, pretty, They're pretty solid. dang good. I, yeah. I could maybe see Helen back replacing uh, Suicide and Redemption on the record. Yeah, Suicide and Redemption is easy, easily the weakest song on the album. It, it's like they yeah. just did that because they were trying to do that Rick Rubin fourth songs, the ballad, the first songs, the thrash yeah. opener, the last songs, the thrash barn burner. I think they were just really doing the lightning uh, puppets justice template. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And I to, think that's go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just gonna. Say, I think that's like sort of my biggest criticism towards it. It seems like a little bit forced at times. Yeah. Um, in making it fit that template. Yeah. Right. Like you were saying. I think that's fair. Yeah. All right. Number eight. Number eight is another standard. We mentioned it before. Creeping death. Creep. Um, it's funny. This song is, was well, like one of my favorites growing up listening to Metallica. And then for some reason, I just kind of didn't listen to it as much. And, uh, Probably just because I listened to it, you know, billions of times and just sort of was checking out other tunes and other whatever. But I've I've kind of gone back to it in recent months and I just am really digging it all over again. I think Metallica Mondays has played a big role in that because I kind of feel like this is like kind of one of the standard tracks for sure. They maybe moved away from a little bit in the live setting on World Wired. Like, it, you know, they're not cranking it out like they are from the bell tolls or it was in a, um, if I recall correctly, it was in a, yeah, it was in a rotating slot. I yeah. can't remember what they rotated it with. Maybe Harvey, but yeah, they were rotating it. It wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. So it, it just, but in recent months, it's just really come back full force for me. Yeah. I just love that track. I mean, what's not to love about it's it? It's a pretty I mean, classic. It's a pretty perfect metal song. Yeah. Any song that talks about the land of Goshen, dudes. I mean, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Is it a Mortal Combat? <laughs> Is it a Mortal Combat level? I don't know. It's just the land of Goshen. It's awesome. All right, number seven. Now, number seven, uh, I, I think you'll appreciate this one. Uh, Where the Wild Things Are. Ooh. Love it. Um, Love it. So it's funny. So, you know, we mentioned that I have a, a nine month old daughter um, and I've just play her every music. Anything like from you know, rain and Beatles blood. To, God hates us all. Christ. Illusion. I, I, she, <laughs> she's heard. She's heard everything from black metal. Yeah. To jazz, you know, um, and some songs are just background noise for her. Some songs are she will actually like kind of perk up and be like, oh, she's like shows an interest in um, and uh, where the wild things are. She was a newborn. I brought her home. She was crying, fussing. I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing with my life. I and know that I'm just like yeah. playing music and trying to find. And then all of a sudden the song came on. I'm like, and she just stopped. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, do you? Do you like this? And what's funny is that what's become um, it, I got to shout you guys out because uh, I created this like relaxed playlist for her, which is like probably like six songs that uh, she just seems to kind of calm down with. And your guys cover of Where the Wild Things Are made the cut. No shit. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, it's man. in there. It's in there with uh, Blackbird by the Beatles and. Uh, just the way you are by Billy Joel. Wow, um, that's awesome. So yeah, it, it made the cut. She she'll 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 hear the guitar and she's like, oh. yeah, yeah. And then she gets really excited and starts shaking. Yeah, uh, that's so awesome. that song, that song, uh, and then of course the lyric material and stuff. It just since becoming a father, I uh, that song is just kind of totally because yeah. For for those of you who don't know that song as well, it's it's a song sung from the point of view of ki- of a kid, right? Of mm-hmm. It's it's about their toys coming to life. It's very scary. All children touch the sun, burn yeah. fingers one by one. It's interesting. So oh, it talks about like a waking up sleepy head and yeah. it's time to save your world. It's really cool. Time and to go, also, time like to go to the potty. Of... <laughs> it's time to go pee pee poo poo. Yeah. That's that was a rejected <laughs> verse, actually. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's that really cool. Yeah. All right. Uh number six, I mentioned before, bleeding me. Um, but I, I went with the helping hands acoustic version. Yeah. Um, to mix it up. I, 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 I love, love 
the acoustic version of this. James's voice on it in the chorus is just top notch, a lot of soul. Um, I, I think uh, not to go on a riff here, but it, I mentioned this before on Metallicast. Uh, James is like a very underrated, soulful singer. Sure. And uh, I think he really shows that in the acoustic version of this. Yeah. And like I said, it's one of my favorite Metallica songs of all time. And it's because he didn't really start. He didn't really start doing it until Black Album. But he didn't really kill it until Load and Reload. That yeah, very buttery, sultry thing that he mm-hmm. sort of climaxed with S and M, I think. But yeah, those first big records were just more barky, which yeah, is, which well, is killer. But he didn't have a lot of opportunity to sing that way. Yeah, right. for sure. I mean, what what gravitates me more towards the old albums are. The riffs, the solos, yeah, the, the power, the compositions, the energy the, for sure, the epic sound, the epicness of it all. Yeah, what gravitates me towards load and reload are more the lyrics, the voice, the emotion. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I went with the acoustic version of that for number six, and then I followed it up with another Helping Hands version, their cover of When a Blind Man Cries. Oh my god, I love that cover. Ooh, dude. nice Deep purple. choice. It's uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if there's any band that consistently does covers as great as Metallica does. Man, they really the, do crush it when they record them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like when they rearrange them. Yeah. I was just having this conversation on my show with somebody for an episode that's going to be out soon. And uh, we were just talking about Garage Inc. for a little bit. And, you know, we're like, how many bands? It, usually when a band comes out with a cover album, you're like, eh, it's kind of like a cash grab it's kind of there's very few people that can that can really add something to these songs and metallica is definitely one of those bands and 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 like turn the page is a perfect example right like you 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 can take it i think it's kind of easier to take like an obscure diamond head song and kind of make it your own just because of people's lack of familiarity with it but like turn the page is like a classic song in its own by bob seger right right? and 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 i feel like there's so many people now like oh yeah i like that metallica song turn the page (laughs) <laughs> you know well and they also uh, just other, i mean that's a a, a, a bad example because that song was so big but they were historically pretty good at choosing songs that were pretty obscure yeah uh, right, you know ethan yeah. has a story that the 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 two tri- was am i evil and blitzkrieg maybe that what were the two that came out on the kill em all reissue a- am i evil and, Bl- and blitzkrieg uh, and you thought those were metallica songs a lot well, of people I, I did, yeah because that reissue they, it, it, it was a part of the track listing of kill em all and but so how, I yeah, thought totally. these are Metallica songs. That that was my first intro to it. And how many people heard, had, knew the song Crash, Cor- Crash Course and Brain Surgery or, you know, Free right. Speech for the Dumb, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, they, that was Metallica was my introduction to the Misfits. Yeah, yeah. same. For know, me like, too. I, I, I love the Misfits. I would I would call them probably my favorite punk band. But I I mean, I know Last Crest, Green Hell, originally from Metallica. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Same. Same Z's. Same okay, All right, number next four. One. So number four, I went with, uh, you know, this is what I'm currently listening to. I went with uh, the S&M 2 version of Moth into Flame they just released. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gnawing at the bit for any S&M 2 I can get. Um, it, you know, it was cool hearing Nothing Else Matters. Love the song, love the arrangement. But, you know, we we heard it on yeah, the first I'm, S&M. I'm good. I'm good on that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so hearing the the other two new songs was a real treat. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure Moth into Flame works as well as some of the other songs and for the symphony arrangement, but I've really been digging. I think the band sounds fantastic on the recording. Yeah. Um, and I've just been spinning and trying to like pull out all the little nuances that the strings are adding and the horns and the whole kid and caboodles. They right. Say, you know, First time I believe Kit and Caboodle has ever been uttered as a phrase on Metal Up Your Podcast. <laughs> I think it's the first time it's been uttered in about <laughs> in 25, 40 30. years. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Since We're the, get the whole Kit and Caboodle, you see? <laughs> yeah, see? Extra, extra. Read all about it, see? Uh, okay, top three. Top three right now. Uh, again, I mentioned this one before, Broken Beat and Scarred. Mm. Um, I could sort of... Uh, the song came on Shuffle not that long ago. Um, and... I was just like, oh, yeah, this song's really good. And uh, I, like I said, I love the melody. I think it's a very uh, powerful song. I think it's a great live song, again, that I wish they would pull out more. Uh, but, yeah, Broken Beat and Scarred. Great, great tune. Love that one. All right. My, uh, my second spot um, is a classic off my all-time favorite Metallica album. 
disposable sweet heroes. amber oh well sorry what <laughs> <laughs> i was actually just making notes of like i was just noticing that there was no puppets on your list but here we are disposable heroes That's what do you think about the all within my hands version of that it's pretty different yeah i, I like it it's cool I like it. yeah and, and see what i like about the metallica acoustic shows it, is that for the most part, they'll take like a Thrasher song and completely rearrange it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I've said this before on Metallica. I, I like Megadeth. They're they're honestly one of my favorite metal bands, but I shit on them a lot because they're an easy target. Did someone and, say uh, Megadeth? What are y'all talking about over there? <laughs> my palms and or kneecaps are getting sweaty. Ooh. <laughs> You got to get the ooh in there and the little. Ah. I've just been hanging out at the hangar 18. <laughs> anyway, peace cells. Who's buying? Dude, you, in his, this economy. His, <laughs> his record titles have that mistake. Like, he think you know, like, biz, what is the killing's my business? Business is good. I'm like, dude, do all your records have to do that? They're, uh, yeah, they do. They, there's uh, it's fun. Cells, it is fun. He likes buying? to take. So far, so good. <laughs> so what? So what? <laughs> so far, so good. So what? Amazing, dude. Just like the Pine Piper. Anyway. <laughs> well, Easy Target. Who um, says, did someone say something about an Easy Target? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always say, uh, so on Metallicast, we frequently go off on Dave Mustaine tangents and impressions. And uh, before you know, I'm like, oh, I think this is Megadeth cast now. We've been talking about mm-hmm. Dave for we've been riffing on Dave for 15 minutes, but um, we've had people uh, write in and tell me to quit picking on Dave. Yeah, people <laughs> I swear to God, people got have upset written with in and been like, "You need to leave Dave alone." I'm like, That's well, not it's, cool. It's funny because I'm like, people are like, "Oh, would you ever have a uh, Mustaine on your show?" I'm like, obviously, I, I don't think he would do it, but I'm like, I think hell yeah, it'd be awesome to talk to him. Yeah, He's, he is like, I I I love I love most of Megadeth's music. Not so much over the last 10 to 15 years, but um, I love a lot of their 80s, 90s output, and uh, it, it'd be a dream to talk to him. But I'd like if if he ever got wind of what I've said about him on the podcast, I would completely burn that bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're in the same boat, bro. No, <laughs> Oh, yeah, for sure. No worries there, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Dude, tell us about the time you smoked hash out of a hole in the ground with Lars. And then you cried <laughs> on some kind of monster. <laughs> I've heard about you guys. I've heard you. Cu- I just miss my little Danish friend. <laughs> oh. well, I heard you guys were making fun of me on your podcast. Nice story. <laughs> Tell it to that Spotify music. I like how we can all do a Mustaine impression that is completely different, <laughs> but you, but everybody can tell we who know it is. We know who it is. Yeah, <laughs> I stick with the Marge Simpson, uh, yeah, variation. That's sort it's of kind of yeah, it's out. kind of Marge Simpson. <laughs> I was just wondering how we got to this point, but then I remembered. Oh, the acoustic versions. Yeah. Um, so I, I use this as an example of Metallica. So I'm like, I, well, everybody I heard, knows you know, I wrote Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, it was called is, When Hell Freezes Over. So what? This is separate from uh, what I was going to say, but check out the Megadeth song When, W H E N, when. It, it's Am I Evil Meets the Call of Cthulhu. Okay. Okay. Like well, because exact. wasn't Call of Cthulhu? Didn't he regurgitate that riff on Hangar 18? Yeah, yeah. The, the chords yeah. are the kind of climbing thing. Are pretty much the same. It's and they're both in D minor. The saddest of yeah. all keys. Yeah, case. But I, I just remember hearing Megadeth acoustic. Ugh. It, it, I mean, vocals aside, Dave doesn't have the best vocals for an acoustic setting. No right. kidding. Um, no but, kidding. But um, the the arrangements are unchanged. So they're playing Skin of My Teeth, and it's just. On acoustic guitars, I'm like, there's, there's nothing to that. Like, oh, it, symphony of destruction, like, yeah, totally, yeah. Oh, yeah, symphony of destruction. It's like the the like the great part about that riff is the power of it. Like, da da, you got to get the crunch. You got, I'm like, on acoustic guitar, just you got to rearrange it. Yeah, you know? so that's right. why I love what Metallica does. Yeah, and you wouldn't. I mean, Metallica probably wouldn't if they played. Uh, a version of Master of Puppets, they wouldn't on acoustic be like, right? Like what they did with Disposable Heroes and actually rearrange yeah, case the song. In point. Yeah, case in it. point, because Dis- Disposable Heroes is almost unrecognizable uh, yeah. compared to Puppets, which is kind of what you want. I mean, yeah. Right. First of all, that riff is just in fucking insane. It's it's definitely one of their most insane, especially that B the that kind of B yeah. section. Yeah. To hear them sort of turn it into that weird 
swampy, creepy thing was really cool and took love, a lot of imagination. Or, or the Four Horsemen is a great Four Horsemen for sure. That too. Yeah. Like they basically turn it into like a almost like a pseudo rockabilly yeah. song right. with like a country twang. I'm like, how did you're talking about that, the, like the poor yeah. retouring me verb? Yeah, they were yeah, doing yeah. When they kind of did that acoustic yeah. set. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally bro. All um, right, number one current number Metallica one, song. Actually, number one sort of ties in with what we were just talking about because I went with the S and M two version of "All Within My Hands." Dude, killer, uh, nice. I, I just, I, it, it's funny. I was just saying on um, every month we've been doing a, I've been doing a live stream, um, and releasing it like within twenty four hours as like a podcast. Um, but on the last live stream we did, we started talking about S and M two because it was the news had just sort of come out, and "All Within My Hands" had just come on like. I'm interested to see what versions of SM2 become sort of like the definitive versions for a lot of fans. Hmm. Um, Cause I know like for me, and again, you can call the metal police on me, um, but like the, the, the definitive version instead of nine one one, by the way, it's six, six, six for the kids, out, for the kids. out there. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Brandon. Unless if it's new metal, I feel like it should be like six, nine or something like that. You know, or it could be zero 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 four. Ooh, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> nice. I think I'm going to call the metal police on you making that joke. Actually, <laughs> all right, fair enough. All um, right. So you were saying what, what the I definitive saying? versions, like because for some people, oh, so yeah, so like the the Call of Cthulhu for me, the definitive version of that song is the S and M version. Mm, great I, I version. I think it's you know like when we look at when I look at the instrumentals, Orion is perfection. Yeah. I, I, that's just a beautiful, beautiful arrangement, beautifully composed. Call of Cthulhu, I like it, but it was it never really stood out to me, even as much as I like Ride the Lightning. And then I heard the SM version; it just made it come to life for me. Yeah, when they I'm very the similar. I, I've always preferred the SM version, and I think for me, the SM two version might eclipse it. Even that, the SM two version, dude. I only heard it the one time in the theater, but. Yeah, and maybe it was just the emotional impact of seeing them all too, and being in a on, uh, being on the big screen. But right, the S and M two version is fucking sick, dude. Well, I mean, the original recording too is just, I mean, it's very it's repetitive, raw. and yeah, it's raw, raw, repetitive. Yeah. So M- Michael Kamen's arrangement that he wrote for S and M, it breaks just it up. So much interesting stuff going on. It just, like you said, it takes it to a different place, man. I, I love yeah. that that version. Yeah. And I I mentioned that because for me. Like this version of All Within My Hands, I think for a lot of fans will become the definitive version um, of the song. Or like Unforgiven 3, I think, you know, SM2 will surpass the Death Magnetic version, I think, when people hear the final mixes. Um, that's just you know, a little bit of speculation. And I guess because of what I was excited about when I first heard it in theaters. But uh, All Within My Hands, for sure. It's way more listenable. Although that, that, there's that one section on St. Anger of the of the song All Within My Hands that has that Death Tones thing that's like one of my favorite sounds on the whole album. Yeah, that's that really drony, cool. That droney, creepy guitar like right before the first verse. Yeah, yeah. They never do it again. It's such a bummer. But but yeah, you're I, right. I, when I first heard this version, it's yeah. basically the same version from the from the uh, All Within My Hands gig, right? Right. So, But it's just with a fucking orchestra and they got that same cat singing BGVs, right? Yeah. They mm-hmm. brought that same auxiliary dude out. Yeah. Yep. It is and an it, amazing it, version. And it just really, like, I, I loved the acoustic version because that's, a, again, a perfect rearrangement yeah. to make a song work in acoustic setting. Right, yeah. But then the strings and the horns and the, the, just the whole orchestra just really fill in all the gaps and holes and add all these counter melodies. It, it's just really, really well done. Love it, man. It's a bitchin' list, dude. I mean, there's that's some really fun list. stuff on here. Rebel of Babylon, Where the Wild Things Are, When a Blind Man Cries, All Within My Hands. It's killer. I just really love the uh, Beyond Magnetic love, man. That was yeah. a, that was that was a surprise for me because <laughs> that was something I didn't really consider when I was making my top ten. Just I didn't because either. It's yeah. not something that uh, I listen to very regularly. So uh, yeah, a very nice surprise. Again, me neither. But it's one again. It's one of those things where I'm listening to it because I'm recording an episode about it, and now it's fresh in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I like these songs, and I and, yeah. and Rebel just like stood out to me. I'm like, this song. Has a lot of meat to it. I do feel like in that way, right? It's so do so we can kind of start to wrap up with this. But doing the podcast, and Ethan and I have talked about this a little bit. There's a sense to where, first of all, it's a gift, it, as far as I consider it, to do the podcast, to be able to have a platform, talk about one of my favorite bands, 
have people who actually listen to it. It's an amazing honor that I treat with utmost respect. But it, it is a weird, it augments your fanship in a way that it would not have happened if you hadn't done the podcast. Because right. because you are committed to doing a good show over at Metallicast, you're listening and thinking about Metallica in ways you wouldn't if you weren't doing that. Yeah. You're researching shit. You're having to like, in an era where you might not listen to Kill Em All for 24 hours straight, you're doing that because you got Johnny Z on the show and maybe Mark, whoever the next day and you want to be prepared. That's right, just right, sort yeah. of artificially impacting how you engage the band. And I think that can totally. have a negative side to it. It can, it can burn you out. It For can sure. make, when you do have that free time where you might have listened to Metallica, you might be like, dude, I'm just going to listen to some fucking Taylor Swift or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how do, you, how do you mitigate and navigate sort of the burnout aspect of this gig? That's a great question. I, I, I do, uh, you know, you do encounter that sometimes because I only have so much time with between work, between my daughter um, and, you know, just do what you need to do to live life. I only have so much time these days to actually like listen to music, especially the way I want to listen to it, which is just like turn the world off. Yeah. And, immersive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very hard, but I, I, I think sometimes it's, you know, I'm never going to complain about listening to Metallica. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, they're just my all time favorite band. It, they're the, they're the one band that I can put on at any point and be happy to listen to. I can't say that about any other artists. Like it for me, I have other favorite artists, obviously some metal, some non-metal, but uh, you know, like I, I find I go through waves with them. Like, Oh, I'm, I'm a really big, uh, uh, Mega Death kick this month. I'm on to Tom Waits. Then I'm on to Johnny Cash or whatever. And, but like Metallica is the one band that mainstay. So having that consistency of them, of my interest with them greatly helps. Um, but it, it's, it, it can be tough when I'm like, I really want to listen to, uh, you know, the new S and M two version, or I want to listen to this new album by this band, but you know, I feel like I have to listen to kill them all. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I think what I do to, to help with that is I just sort of try to gra gravitate towards what I'm currently in the mood of for doing. Yeah. Um, like what, where are my interests in that moment? Am I on a big load kick? Let's do something on load. Am I uh, more into the thrash stuff? Let's do something more old school. Am um, I on a vanilla ice uh, <laughs> B side kick? Am I am I watching Ninja Turtles Part Two: Secret of the Ooze and want to dip into some ninja rap? Yes, the answer is yes. Well, it, it's it's it, as much as possible too. I'll pull in other stuff. So, like for example, I'm a big Nick Cave fan, and uh, he just did an awesome live stream. It was just like him piano. It was just an awesome presentation of some of his songs. Recognize it's not for everybody, um, but I loved it. He's an acquired taste for sure. Yeah. 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 And uh, the reason I mentioned that, though, is because I've, I've since that live stream, I, I've just been like at a super Nick Cave kick again, like going back and re-listening to some of his new albums, some of his old stuff. Um, and I'm like, how do I, how can I, can I tie this into Metallica? Yes, they did Lover Man. So I will. I found a a great podcast out there about Nick Cave. I think we're gonna be doing some kind of crossover thing coming up. So I try to take what I'm like currently listening to, see if I can tie it into the podcast, it, which also helps. I think with you know the creative part of it that I like. Right. Um, and then sometimes too, I just like doing things with like no prep. You know, like I, I love doing the monthly live streams because I'm like I pick a couple things we're gonna talk about, but I don't really do any prep for it. It's just like let's just talk and see what happens um and sometimes that's a necessity for me too just so i have room and space for other things yeah right yeah, i hope cool. that answered your question didn't answer my question I at all sorry we're no. still talking about david stain <laughs> <laughs> no, that was maybe a great answer and it kind of sums uh, up your whole vibe over there too you know so if you haven't already which would be insane go check out metallicast it's it's right it, it's brandon it's wherever you get all the stuff right yeah you can find on apple google spotify everywhere um if I, I do want to mention, when, when will this episode be out? Tomorrow. A couple Perfect. hours. And for those listening, today. Right now. <laughs> so I want to mention this because I think, uh, well, first of all, I think you guys will dig this. And I know that your listeners will. Um, on, I, I mentioned I do a monthly live stream. 
the live stream for August is going to be on August 28th, the release date of SNM2. Mm. It's going to be at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be on the Metallicast Facebook page at Metallicast Pod. It's going to be on our home site, Fantasy Experts YouTube page. And we're going to celebrate the release of SNM2. Is it like a and listening have, party or is it? No, I, I have two very special guests joining me from the San Francisco Symphony. Um, I'm going to be joined by Scott Pingle, who I believe has been on your show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, basis of the symphony did anesthesia point teeth at SNM two, and I have Doug Ryeth, who you might not know by name, but he is the badass tattooed harpist oh, um, was featured nice. in making of SNM documentary, and he's played at both SNM events, right. the original and SNM two. So they're both going to be joining me for the live stream. There'll be uh, you know, as live stream does, there'll be a live chat. So you can interact, ask questions. It's going to be a really fun time. I'm awesome. super excited to talk That's to cool. them. cool. So if you're available the night of SNM2, August 28th, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, check it out. If you miss it because you're busy or uh, you know time difference or whatever, it will be out as a podcast within 24 hours. That's awesome. awesome. That would be so fun. cool. What's the date of that again? Oh, the 28th, the when it comes out. Yeah, the 28th. 8, 8, 8 p.m. Night. Eastern time? 8 p.m. Eastern time. Well, when that gets closer, I'm sure you'll have some links and we'll happily share all those on our socials too. And maybe if totally. uh, Thank you. we're hanging around, we can come visit and hang out and he- heckle you from the comments section. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just be a metal police is here. Yeah. <laughs> Orchestra. The, the, li- the live stream police. Dude, fuck that. I'm not, I don't want a gig with the metal police. If, I'm the if enemy. I, if I, They're my enemy. If I, if I see a, a Dave Mustaine pop up in the chat, I'll assume it's one of you. If you just see a guy asking Scott Pingle a lot of questions about Michael Jordan's <laughs> jump shot, you'll know it's me. <laughs> All right, everyone, go check out Metallicast. It was so nice having you, Brandon. Long time. Thank in, you so in much the, for having me in guys. the workings, and we're so glad that there are people like you out there holding it down for Metallica and uh, and uh, providing yet more interesting conversations about this band that we all love. So we wish you a lot of success in the future. I'm sure our paths will cross again, and uh, I guess we'll just end it right there and say peace. Adios. Yeah, thank you so much, guys, for having me on. It's much appreciated, and uh, I'm happy to be a part of this community. <laughs> if you were our advisor, what would you say? Then I would say, delete that. <laughs> <laughs>